really? This building is going to be something about the future and not about the past? It's going to be a white elephant. Will you even fill it? No one really did believe in it. That's where, I guess, my new life really started. We were a little bit different, very middle, middle class. There was a ceiling of 10. The thing that I was most interested in was being a professional soccer player. That's what took me to Japan, to New Zealand, Hong Kong, to South Africa, Australia, Philippines, Taiwan. Uh, there I was playing in the National League. I was very much an outsider. I was still young, still having fun. I got the introduction to the startup environment. 20 odd years older than me, also an English immigrant. I definitely looked up to him as someone who was successful and he sort of explained me his philosophy. And it really struck me. I decided that that's what I was going to do. He saw something in me and asked whether I would come and join his team. I really became a very, very good. I mean, I would say I was the best. The the entrepreneurial bug had bitten me. Now, I had sold out of my subprime mortgage business in 2006. That was really the thing that, that sort of shifted me into venture capital, I became an angel investor. He, he sort of said, hey, have you heard about this thing called Y Combinator? This was not at a time when Y Combinator was successful. It was just that Y Combinator was different. There was a new model. It was really all about mentors. Very much felt like we were we were on our own because there really was no one else. We were definitely ahead of the game. That was where things started to take off. They were amazing, amazing years. It then did hit a couple of, you know, completely unexpected black swan type events. I don't think no, any, any of us would have really appreciated what was coming. It was quite shocking. I really think I was just flying by the seat of my pants. I think people started to think that I was better than I was. And it was a shock, sort of coming home middle of the day and just sort of almost going back to bed in a semi-depressed state. I may have been lonely. I didn't have any community support. There are times, I guess, when I feel melancholy. It seems as I'm telling you this story, my life feels like it's filled with the bliss of ignorance. Are we really in command of everything or is nature and the universe working through us and sometimes we're just not awake to it? There is an opportunity, a very timely opportunity to go back to the drawing board. Welcome together, we're going to meet the most singular individuals, entrepreneurs, artists, athletes, no matter where you are in your journey, today's story will give you the opportunity to reflect on your questions and challenge your beliefs. I'm Loris. I love creating products, start businesses, but most of all, I love stories and connecting with the most extraordinary doers. In 2024, I'm going to put in a lot of efforts to level up what I'm offering you. If you love the show, the only thing I'm going to ever ask you is to subscribe and share to your friends. I cannot express how much this helped me bring you the most exceptional guest. Thanks so much. Enjoy the show. Great. So, welcome, John. Thanks a lot for, for joining me. And before we jump into presenting yourself and give you more context, I wanted to tell you a little bit of the story and to uh, explain you why I was very interested to, uh, to have you to this podcast. So I believe that one of the reasons why I'm here today is partially because of you. So <laughs> I wanted to give you uh, some context around that. So basically, I, I never meant to come to, to Canada. Uh, my, my goal was to go in the US where I studied. And we only came to Canada because my, my wife was pregnant and she wanted to give birth in a French speaking environment. Okay. But we never knew anyone in, in Canada. We had no connection whatsoever. It was never a dream or an expectation of mine. 
So we came here just to uh, for, for our son to, uh, to 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 get born, and the reason why we never left ten years later is first of all because I had a job into uh, congratulations in, <laughs> thanks <laughs> into uh, a, <coughs> a couple of startup into you invested so Buzzbird first so mm-hmm. so Buzzbird who uh, who hired me first and believed in me and and uh, financed my work permit to to come to Canada so yeah. uh, indirectly thanks to to your support during the 2014 uh, uh, years uh, with uh, when when they got their uh, Serie A I believe yeah. uh, this money served uh, to to me move in Canada and second what I really loved about Montreal that I believe were a main differentiator compared to the valley where uh, I, I used to, to study were the, the, the community. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really loved and felt like there was a deep connection within the Montreal community that I didn't found neither in Paris where I come from nor in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. I felt like there was this sol- solidarity within uh, Montrealers where I felt like everyone was trying to work together to uh, make Montreal born again from its ashes, I would say, right? After the, the dot-com bubble, uh, the, the dot-com uh, era. So, and at w- one of the pillars of this ecosystem, trying to work together to, to, uh, to learn, to grow, and to be supportive was Real Ventures. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming in, in Montreal and trying to figure out what were some of the the main communities to uh, to to be in to to connect and reventure uh, was was one of these places where there was a lot of opportunities uh, to and where i i believe that the future of montreal were coming from there so um, Obviously, I didn't know you at the time, <laughs> at least for, for, from far, and this is the first time that we are really uh, meeting together. Yeah. Um, but I, every time someone was working at real or, uh, or were uh, going through the Notman House, etc., I always ask what it felt to, uh, to, to be in relationship directly with, uh, with, with the team, right? And a lot of people came to me mentioning how much, uh, how great you were. How much? How, how much? Uh, the 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 quantity of candid feedback that you you were providing. So, for a long time, you were this figure, this uh, like type of parental figure in for the Montreal ecosystem that I always type of um, foresee as one of the grand uh, godfather, I will say, of of the of the whole uh, ecosystem. So, I'm very glad to to have you here today because. Of well, all thanks of for that story, Loris. I really appreciate it. It's great to. Great to get that background. Yeah, and we're working to obviously go through what it meant to create this ecosystem and all the challenges that you have been, all the reward and uh, and uh, outcomes from from it. But to start, I would like to to go back to what it means also to be an immigrant, right? Mm. Um, I believe that something that uh, that you shared was that the sense of community is important when you are an immigrant. Uh, you are an immigrant yourself, right? Yeah. Uh, a serial immigrant, uh, actually. Right. So I would like to start today's episode by trying to go back in time <coughs> a little bit and trying to understand what were some of those driving forces that made the, the young John leaving the UK to, to go in Asia. Hmm. Yeah, um, well, it actually goes back even earlier than that. My The first time that I became an immigrant. I was ten, oh, okay. and uh, my my dad w- was transferred from the company in the UK to New Zealand. Mm-hmm. So at the age of ten, he took me and my brother and sister and mo- and mum uh, from England to the other side of the world to New Zealand. So that was it. Was I was ten. Uh, we ended up living in New Zealand for five years. Um, I actually got my New Zealand citizen. We all got our New Zealand citizenship. And so left, left when I was 15, but that was the first immigrant experience. And there was, even at that age, there was a real, a realization that we were a little bit different. Um, you know, our mum dressed us in strange clothes when we went to 
mass, the first the first mass that we went to, the Sunday mass when we arrived in New Zealand and we were all dressed up very smartly in our jackets and long trousers in, you know, what was stifling heat and we could people could tell we were different. So I think that was the first one. And it was, uh, I had an amazing time in New Zealand and that's why I ended up going back there when I was 22, 23. But it was the first immigrant experience and, you know, the the contrast between all of the the differences and although New Zealand is not it's uh, it's not Africa it's not Asia relative to England it's still it is it is still different and um, it was both challenging um, you know challenging and and also re- very rewarding and. Um, so that was the first immigrant experience. And then going back to England, we weren't immigrants, but you know, from 10 to 15, it's pretty formative years. So when we went back to England at 15, we were almost immigrants again. Yes. Okay. And our, our, our act, we all had, ac- we all had Kiwi accents and thought a little bit differently than the people in England. And so that was again a period of a period of readjustment. Um, and then at the age of 23, uh, having finished university and worked a little bit in England, deciding that England wasn't really the place that I wanted to grow up or con- you know continue growing up, should I say? Yeah. Um, Why so? I think I think the, the there was there was two things. One, the the relationships that I'd formed in New Zealand mm. at that age were very very special, very tight. I thought um, when I went back, you know, life had moved on, and I didn't really stay friends with any of the people I was when I'd left. Mm. But it just felt different. So there was that. Uh, that dream quality to the life that I'd had in New Zealand, particularly the last year or two mm-hmm. that was attracting me back. That was the attractor. And I guess the driving me away was sort of this sense of, I think really it was about class. You know, the UK, less so now, I think, although I'm not living there. Mm. But there was really growing up there, there was this sense of the class that you were in. You were lower class, middle class, upper class. I mean, I was middle, middle class, very middle, middle class. I mean, was understood. That's, Mm -hmm. that's where I was. Um, and whether it is true or not, because it wasn't like that in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, there was this sense of there was a ceiling in New Zealand. No, uh, in the UK. In, in, in the yeah, UK. Yeah, there was yeah. this. There was this sense of a ceiling. Now, whether that's true or whether that was just in my mind, yeah. I don't know. But it was not something that I really was aware of when I was in New Zealand, and I was yeah. certainly aware of when I came to the UK. And uh, yeah, as I said, I don't think it. Ex- I don't think it feels the same these days. Yeah. But that was a, a reason to say, hey, I, I don't really want any limits. And I I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I yeah. was... Um, you just wanted to be into this land of opportunities exactly. and uh, not being limited by uh, anything else. Yeah. D- did you went back into New Zealand by yourself or did you uh, went yeah. back with... Uh, On my own. Yeah. Um, my mum my still tells the story of being, like feeling that she had driven me away she wanted me to do more, etc., which wasn't the case. Mm. But um, you yeah, know, it was it was all on my own. Twenty two, landed in Boston, then landed in San Francisco, mm. and then uh, told people in San Francisco that I was going to or- flying to Auckland the next day. They said, "Why are you flying to Auckland? You just drive over the bridge." I mm. said, "No, not Auckland, Auckland." <laughs> and uh, so I headed headed to New Zealand when I was twenty two. 22. Yeah. So 
<laughs> what it is to just go into New Zealand at 22 and have to create your own life. I mean, you you studied sports science, right? Yeah. So um, w were you envisioning to, to pursue your career into athletics, into the athletic industry at the time or? No, um, not particularly. So after studying sports science, at that time, sports science was there was no real there wasn't really many careers mm. in sports science uh like people who were studying sports science people thought you were going to go on and do become a pe teacher or something which was not where i my interest lie mm. my interest was primarily in sports psychology and so the the but in terms of jobs because there was the physiology aspect one of the easiest jobs to get not easy but easiest jobs to get was in um, the pharmaceuticals industry selling and in my case yeah. because I am um, sometimes a talker um, or um, happy speaking I got a job as a as a pharmaceutical sales rep and so when I was leaving the UK to head to New Zealand uh, I imagined that I would probably use that as the way to mm. to land and when i landed in new zealand you know in terms of the jobs that i look for it was all related to the pharmaceuticals industry yes. and although it was a sales job i mean i genuinely thought that i was selling something that mattered mm. that was important i remember that was important yeah. to me that i was selling something that mattered something that um something would help people so it's 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 super interesting because when we're going back to this time and you're mentioning that what interested you during your, your studies were really the, the psychology of uh, athletes, right? And now you are in, you, you are you, you have invested yourself over the past 20 years at least into uh, supporting, mentoring uh, entrepreneurs as, as well, right? Which mm. is another type of uh, yeah, absolutely. Exercise, it's right? very so, similar. So w w one of these um, line there's this guiding lines uh from from this beginning to to now is really your your desire to to support to understand top performers in in a sense right or people who wanted to achieve things that were maybe uh extraordinary ex extraordinary in in a sense why you did you feel like you had this this interest into those type of personalities you know, when you look back, you can always draw a line between two points. Yeah. I'm not sure that I was drawing the line between two points. I mean, anyone that knew me at the time knew that when I was at university and then when I first went to New Zealand, the thing that I was most interested in was being a professional soccer player mm. or footballer, as I would call it. That was really... Your thing. That was my. That was all I really yeah. cared about. I mean, I was working, uh, and I wanted to make sure that if I was having a job, that it it did mean something yeah. uh, at that time. But I, I, I just, I just wanted to have a life which allowed me to play, play football. Yeah. Um, Were you playing in at in England at, at the time? Or? Well, in England, I was. It was. It was just at university. Although okay. we were playing in a. And we were playing in a in a very good university league. We were playing against all the the youth teams, all the all the professional yeah. clubs, the Premier League, current clubs. When I went to New Zealand, uh, there I was playing in the National League, which is their their top league, okay. and I was the second worst player in the second worst team in the best league. So, but it was really just about that, and so I would say. Uh, then the thing, the reason I say that you can draw two lines backwards, but perhaps that wasn't what I was looking, was that I, when I think back on it, I mean, I really wanted to be professional footballer. I guess I would call myself semi-professional, uh, but I never really, and maybe I'd never have been good enough to play for the national team in New Zealand and stuff like that, although my, my teammates were, but I never really did enough. I never pushed myself. Mm. So this idea that I sort of understood what it took to be a professional athlete, um, if I did understand it, I certainly wasn't living it. 
I was still young, still having fun. I I wanted to I wanted to play at the best level, but I never really did the work that's necessary in order to do mm. it. So that's why I'm sort of like I'm not so sure that I yeah. I knew it. And I think the reason I went and studied sports science was just because I love sport. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was uh, Yeah. But the psychology aspect of it definitely interested me and, and I you know, the line back that you drew, I I do draw it and mm. and I think it comes phil philosophically to the idea of are we really in command of everything or is nature and the universe working through us and sometimes we're just not awake to it yeah. and I definitely wasn't awake to it back then no. I definitely think I was more awake to it when I started working with founders and primarily because I think I had done much more work as a founder than I had as a you know aspiring yeah. footballer so you you are in you, you are 22 uh you are you, you have this dream of becoming um, a professional footballer you try to make a living uh, selling uh, uh being being a, a sales rep i believe in, yeah, in, the, in, pharmaceuticals. in, in the pharmaceuticals uh, yeah. company what what drove you to uh, and i took some notes here to to start working more into the the tech world right trying to be a product manager into uh in in, in new zealand and and to leave this industry <clears throat> well Uh, so, I did manage to get a, a job in um, in the uh, let's call it the pharmaceutical. So it wasn't pharmaceuticals; it was actually uh, orthopedic implants, which has many funny stories. But uh, I, I think again, if I look back, I had an unwarranted level of confidence. And that unwarranted level of mm -hmm. confidence actually caused me to be fired or let go of on the day before my three months was up. I see. So I went there, I got the job, I was new in town, and um, I was very happy with the job, but lost it after three months. And it was a shock, mm. called into the office and said, sorry, that's it. And there was a... There was a, um, I guess, a moment of reflection, but I ended up realizing, well, I didn't really have any money. Um, I needed to get another job. Yeah. And I did eventually manage to get another job, and it was now sort of sc scraping the barrel. And I ended up getting a job at Fuji Xerox, which was the the New Zealand version of Xerox. And, you know, that's now, I'm now gone from selling something that I believed in to just selling whatever I could. Yeah. And it was actually, it wasn't even selling photocopiers, which is the classical, you know, thing that everyone would laugh on. It was worse than that. It was selling photocopying services. So I would go to people and say, give me things that you want yeah. us to photocopy. <laughs> and I did that job for about nine months and pretty much hated every day. Mm. It was a terrible job. I really didn't like it. There was some great, uh, there was some nice people around me and that's sort of what led me into tech, but I really didn't enjoy the job. And I was sort of coming home middle of the day and just sort of almost going back to bed in a mm. semi-depressed state, then getting up and going back out again. And, uh, but I was really fortunate and there was a, Another another man who was working, doing the same job as me, his name was Hure Tauranga. Uh, he was a Maori. And he uh, he got promoted to run a brand new division of Xerox, selling a whole new range of really small photocopiers, printers, faxes. Everything was really taking off in that, in that world at that stage. Um, and he saw something in me and asked whether I would come and join his team, even though I'd been useless in the team that we'd been in together. And I really, I really enjoyed working with him and I really enjoyed the team he built. And I really became a very, very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say I was the best 
salesperson. There was no doubt about it in terms of just the numbers and everyone recognized it. I was very good at selling photocopiers yeah. and faxes. And so I did that for maybe a year and a half, two years, and uh, was thoroughly enjoying it. And I got headhunted to go and become one of the first salespeople, first six salespeople for a brand new mobile phone company. This is when the new, all the GSM yes. licenses were all being issued. And Bell South from Atlanta decided that they would bid and they won a license in New Zealand to operate a mobile phone network, a GSM mobile phone network. And there was only one other network at the time. And uh, I, uh, I was headhunted to join them. And that is where I got both real tech experience tech experience mm -hmm. because it was you didn't need to learn some of the some of the, I guess the cutting edge tech yes. that was happening at the time but also I got the introduction to the startup environment uh, I think I was employee number 34 mm -hmm. and I was employed before the product was available there was yeah. no network yeah. and I spent three years really uh, and there was a lot of opportunity for growth, opportunity for new roles, and I was a uh, amazing environment. So, so once again, uh, a place where you have you, you had no barriers, where there were a lot of opportunities to uh, to expand and, and to learn uh, yeah. things. I believe that's right. Yeah. So you, your role within this um, startup, let, let's call it this way, or at least this branch, uh, this uh, new branch in, in New Zealand was really to, to be a sales rep and you you had to to learn the, um, to be like a sales engineer we will call it this way to to uh, to understand how things were working and trying to uh, to, to really uh, um, understand the technology behind your product right. I needed to understand the technology although I wouldn't I wouldn't go as far as saying a sales engineer that would yeah. be uh, disrespectful to <laughs> real sales engineers yes. I know one or two real sales engineers and they're amazing people to be able to balance those two things yes. is something pretty special. I didn't have that quite, but uh, but it was it was about but it you it was about it so it was just that we were in the tech industry and we we're in the startup industry. And I think the thing which the thing which I uh, and I I too tells this story. I come back to what I said before about being willing to do the work and. That was something where I remember I was I was enjoying it. It was having fun. There wasn't too much pressure, but you know we were we were doing something. We had, you know, this was in two, uh, this was in 1993. So I had a mobile phone at 1993, and I was I think I was 25 years old and 24, 25 years old, and I was like that was pretty cool to have yes. a mobile phone back then, and I didn't have to pay for any of the calls. Yeah, even better, exactly. but. I remember one day I went into the office, um, normal working hours there, like for, for 8.30. It starts at 8.30. And one I went in one day at 7.30. There was something I needed to do. I can't remember. I'd only been working there maybe eight months, nine months. And there was a, another guy in there. His name was Howard Phoebe. And, 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 I, and I was like, oh, uh, like you're, you're, you're here already as well. Yeah. And he said to me, John, I'm here. He was more senior than me. And I said, he said, I'm here every day at six o'clock. Um, and he sort of explained me his philosophy of why he went in early and got stuff done. And it really struck me, really struck me. And I decided that that's what I was going to do. So I just for some reason said, I'm going to go into work six o'clock every day for the next year. Because of of trying to be productive and efficient or because of being dedicated and being passionate about your job? I would say it was, it was about the experiment of what that would bring. Um, it was, it was an environment. Yeah, it was about, it was just an experiment. It was like, well, why is he doing that? I, there's some, what, it's almost like I couldn't see what he was necessarily getting. Mm. We didn't go into that much detail, but it was like, oh, okay, there's something that causes him to do it. He doesn't need yeah. to do it. 
And I definitely looked up to him as someone who was like successful mm. in his field. So I ended up doing it. And what I came to realize was I could get so much work done. I wasn't being distracted. Uh, maybe I had a little bit of, you know, ADD or something, <laughs> but uh, maybe I did, but I, I wasn't getting distracted yeah. and I just got so much work done. And when everyone came in, I spent most of my time walking around and talking to people and that walking around and talking to people meant that I was available to help and people realized that I was getting my work done and I was on top of things and I think people started to think that I was better than I was mm. and with that came more opportunity, more roles and I moved into product management out of sales and uh, had an amazing leader in that, a guy called Andrew Barton, and had an amazing leader and really enjoyed the product management. And that was where things started to take off because at that point, when I went into product management and I was responsible for all the mobile phone handsets. Mm. And mobile phone handsets, after the, after the, the network infrastructure was the big, second biggest spend of the company. And I was responding in, in terms of manufacturing. The, the, you were ma man, 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 no, not manufacturing, but in terms of buying them. Oh, so, oh. like you, you, you spent a lot of money with all of the infrastructure suppliers yeah. for the cell towers mm -hmm. and such like, and you spent a lot of money with the handset manufacturers. Okay. So I was riding the. I was responsible for the second biggest investment that mm -hmm. the. The firm was the company was making. B B Bell House in New Zealand or uh, Bell House overall? Just in New yeah, Zealand. New Zealand yeah. But this was a time when it was actually really hard. They're like getting handsets was like the Wild West. And uh, so two things happened. One, I was now, because I was writing the biggest checks, I was dealing directly with the CEO, which had sort of left me three. That was now I'd sort of jumped three levels in mm -hmm. terms of my interactions. I got exposed to so much more about what was going on. Um, the CEO was a guy called Keith Davis, uh, and he was like 20 odd years older than me, also an English immigrant. And so it was really interesting learning from, learning from him. And that, that sense of, uh, both dealing with that level of people, but also I was now starting to travel a lot of time into Europe and Asia, trying to source more handsets mm -hmm. and there was there was the the sales there was the negotiation it was you know again it was another you you talked about the freedom mm. this was a whole other level of freedom mm. with writing big checks with big money dealing with people that wanted you to write the checks yeah. with them so there's a whole new set of experiences and that's what really took me up to and, and to you, asia and and you felt successful as well right so it, it was also this, this feeling of feeling like you are maybe at the right place i would say it definitely after, felt yeah. that i would say getting into the mobile phone industry so in 1993 and i rode the mobile phone industry until 1999 mm -hmm. that was the you know that those were the years yeah. they were amazing amazing years um but i would yeah at, at that time at that time, I was still playing football. Okay. Um, but at 27, I sort of realized, okay, you've a, you've achieved as good as you're going to achieve. Mm. This is pretty good. You're playing in the National League. You know, my goalkeeper played in the 1982 World Cup. My coach right. was the New Zealand coach for the 1982 World Cup. So, like, what more? You know, you're not going to get anything more. Mm. And the the entrepreneurial bug had bitten me. And so that was where my mind shifted from try, my spare time was from football yeah. to entrepreneurship and trying to start a new company. So you started Forte Communications uh, at the time? Yeah, yeah, Forte was the company. Um, <clears throat> and that company, we started that in about 19... 95. Who's, so, who's who? Who's, so there was myself uh, okay. and another person who was working with me at Bell South at yeah. the time. Um, he was much more on the engineering side. Um, and there was another person who was a 
a friend or business partner of his. And um, we actually asked him to become the CEO, a guy called Jason Kerr. We asked him to become the CEO because one of the first customers we wanted to sell our product to, and it was in the mm. short messaging, text messaging world, uh, which is very, very early days back then. Uh, we it, it was an e uh, SMS to email gateway, right? That's so right. Basically, when someone was sending an uh, SMS to a mobile phone, you were able to redirect it towards um, the individual email. That's right. Or if someone wanted to send an email and convert it to a text message, the right. idea was yeah. it was it was sort of how could you use a mobile phone like a BlackBerry when BlackBerry mm. didn't exist, and so we were sending. How could you use your mobile device as an email device was the real yeah. thinking about it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so then this is in 1995. Yeah. So we were definitely ahead of the game. And that, that uh, but the first customer we wanted to sell this gateway to was Bell South. We couldn't do it because we were still working at Bell South. Mm. So we hired someone else to come in and be the CEO and the, the co-founder. And so, uh, yeah, so that was, that was that business. And, um, that was it successful. Would you say that it was a successful business? At the time? It was, I mean, it ended up being very successful. Um, but it was very successful, not because it managed to scale and deliver. We had a, a few customers. We had a customer, uh, um, we had, we had Bell South as a customer. Uh, we had a customer in Australia. And we had a, a customer in South Africa. Mm. And, but the success came as a result of people recognizing the, how far ahead of its game it was and both the software, but also the IP. And in the end, mm. it was bought because a, a company in the US recognized the IP power of what we had. So we hadn't really had a chance to scale it fully, but it was still was still a very healthy exit. Okay. Yeah. So you are 27, 29. Uh, you have this first entrepreneurial experience. Um, yeah. And then um, you decide to join uh, Brightpoint. Yeah. And um, focusing on for, for a couple of years there. And and then you, uh, you, you, you continue to have through um, up to your 30, um, 30 years um, birthday, I, I would say, the opportunity to uh, to run the Asian operations for uh, Ethos Communications, right? And from from what I understood, you 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 had to open a lot of different offices within Asia. So something that I wanted to um, to explore a bit with you was earlier you mentioned that one of your uh, manager mentor at belt house builds this amazing team uh, and you wanted to, to join this team right so what you believed were the the right um, team culture uh, um, um, philosophies uh, i would say that are specific to these asia regions and what were the things that you were focusing on when opening offices to, uh, within the uh, all Asia, you know, uh, I have to say, I really think I was just flying by the seat of my pants. I had no, I had no idea. I had no strategy. I like even that question of what is you know company culture and those types of things. Maybe it was being discussed back in 1993. Mm. Well, I'm sure it was, but you know, I'm not sure when uh, when Drucker uh, sort of said, "Culture eats strategy for breakfast." I don't mm. know when he wrote that book, but um, I, I really it wasn't really even thinking about it. It was, but I will say, um, it was primarily. Uh, single guys who were willing to do nothing but work. Yeah. And I don't say that, I mean, I say that with a degree of awareness today that mm. I didn't have back then. And it's certainly not reflective of how I think about culture and teams today, mm. but it was like, you've just got to 
find people who've got nothing else but yeah. work yeah. and have fun. And that was really a bit. It was about work hard, play hard. Mm. I would say not work hard, play hard in the Gordon Gecko-ish type of way, but the, the people that I was working with, I loved going out to have dinner and drinks with because we had nothing else but what it was we were mm. building. Uh, and so you mentioned earlier that you, um, around those 27 uh, years old, you, you were um, stuck by the, the entrepreneurial uh, bug, right? And why after your, your um, forte communication experience, you didn't continue to, to, uh, to start businesses? Why moving back into this, uh, this position of, of, of being an employee? Uh, so, yeah, uh, I think it was circumstantial. So we started Forte when I was still working at Bell South mm. and we needed to raise some money. And again, this is in now in 1995-ish and or maybe 96. And I, I didn't know anything about venture capital. I don't even know if anyone in, in New Zealand knew anything about venture capital. And so I was just looking for people that had some, might have some money. And as I mentioned, I was doing a lot of work with my mobile phone handset business mm. and the that was up in Asia and bright point that you mentioned that I joined, there was a, a gentleman there, John McLean Arnott. I was buying phones from bright point and they were, they were one of the suppliers for bell South. And so I was spending quite a lot of time in Hong Kong, which was where they were headquartered. Technically they weren't bright point, but they were about to be bought by bright point. And so there was a lot of time up there and I built a strong relationship with this guy, John McLean Arnott. And he, and, and so I sort of suggested to him, Hey, would, would he and his firm be interested in investing in our forte mm -hmm. communications? And he said, you know what? I will, I will invest some money into that company on two conditions. One, that we get the distribution rights okay. and two in, in, a, in, in, well, the, the, uh, distribution rights. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that you come and work for us and you effectively sell the product. So I went from working for Bell South and having a startup sort of on the side to now working for Brightpoint and having the startup front and center I see. and so the opportunity made a lot of sense so it was like an intra entrepreneur it was entrepreneur of, yeah. and i would say if you look at and i mean in addition to doing that the very first thing within two weeks he and i had to move to asia yeah to from new zealand yeah. to, in order to do this yeah. and within two weeks of moving up to i was going to think i was going to base myself out of singapore i was there for two weeks there was a discussion that we had and we thought, okay, we're looking beyond mobile. We're looking beyond text messaging. We're looking what's happening in the whole mobile industry. And the other thing that was starting to take off in the mobile industry, and I want to say starting, I think in Europe, there may have been one or two prepaid mobile phone networks. And so prepaid was something that, that JMA, as I call John McLean Arnott, JMA, sort of had was from South Africa and he was like, Hmm, I've seen what happened with electricity metering. There could be something really interesting here with mobile metering. And so after two weeks, he says, look, I know someone down at Vodafone in uh, Vodacom in uh, South Africa. Why don't you go down there and see if you can sell them a pre a prepaid mobile phone network, yeah. even though we didn't have a product. So I actually went down there and again, I'm now still an entrepreneur. I go to South Africa and it was supposed to be just for a reconnaissance and a couple of meetings. And I spent the next 15 months there and never, I only went back to New Zealand once, um, that which was sort of where my home still was and um, ended up 
leading the, as an entrepreneur the development of a prepaid mobile phone network in South Africa, uh, MTN's play, Pay As You Go. And that was an amazing success mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur. And, but complete freedom. Like it was, like I was, I didn't have to raise capital. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, it was a complete entrepreneurial ex ex experience. So you had the, the financial security of being an employee within an organization that were making money with other yep. source of income, and you had the opportunity to fly it around the world, trying to launch businesses, trying to sell, yep. and trying to... Yeah. yeah. So we did the same thing in after South Africa. We did the same thing in Australia with Telstra. And then the same thing uh, in the Philippines, and then the same thing in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And it was while I was in Taiwan, I then got approached to flip over and do another entrepreneur. Brightpoint at that time was a publicly traded company, mm -hmm. but this was an entrepreneur within a venture back company. This was in now 1990, late 98. 99 and this was ethos communications mm -hmm. and ethos was the technology provider that i that i had been working with that provided the technology to run prepaid networks so i'd been setting up the whole prepaid network uh, but the technology provider was ethos and it was out of the uk and one day they sort of approached me and said hey like you you're the only person that seems to be selling our product, would you come and start our business in Asia? Yeah. And so again, it was another entrepreneur exper uh, entrepreneur experience, complete freedom to just mm. set up wherever I wanted. And so set up. W w were you a, a one-man team at the time or did you have a, like a group of people that were following you from one place? To one one-person team. Yeah. Now, yeah, one-person team. Um, did, you, did you feel lonely some, sometime during those times of um, well, although I was a one person team, I would say I would very quickly had one or two other people. Mm. Uh, and I'd, I'd also say, I don't know that I had the time to be lonely. Uh, so I, I would say, should, should I say maybe I may have been lonely on an emotional side, but not on a business side. I mean, I was you know, I was still, I was now, you know, heading towards 30 and was still very much a single guy, never really had any time to, to, to sort of bond with any, anyone for any long time. So that maybe on that side, but not on the business side, the business side, it was just go, go, go. And, um, yeah. So, But what I will say, coming back to the community, there was a recognition of being, um, not really being part of anything, not part of the, I wasn't part of a, I didn't have any community support. Yeah. I, I, you know, this is, I said before, it was single guys that could both do the work and keep me company, yeah. I guess. I don't know that I was thinking that way, but that's. That's that's really what it was, um, but that was uh, that that joining joining Ethos was a an amazing move. Uh, I mean, I was on a plane every three days, and it was in an industry that was really growing, and we just we were just knocking it out of the park. Mm -hmm. So I, I got and I got to experience so many countries. I you know hired someone to head up our Beijing office, someone to head up our Delhi office, someone, someone in, in Sydney, lots of people in Kuala Lumpur, uh, also in Taipei. So, plenty of time in Hong yeah. Kong. It was, it was a, a special time, and you know we were, we were selling, selling, selling. I mean, like never sold as much yeah. in uh, never since and before. It was. Amazing time. Could you tell me more about the the live door experience? Did you move to Japan after that? To uh, what what drove you to uh, to go into yeah. Japan? So because there is, I believe, 
there's Asia and there's Japan, right? Yeah, uh, there's, it, uh, I agree. Yeah. Japan is Japan is a is a very unique place, yeah. amazing place, and so the 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 ethos experience was so good and things were taking off so quickly. We got bought. The company got bought very very quickly. Um, it was a, a positive outcome for me. But it got bought by a company called Logica Alderscon, which is actually now owned by a Montreal company. Oh, really? And, um, and they wanted me to stay on and had 10,000 people. I had no interest. So after a six month, I, I sort of, I said I'd agree to do a six month transition. But then it was a question of what am I going to do next? And I got, um, I was still in touch with the CEO of who was the CEO of Bell South going back many years. We built a strong relationship and he had been offered an opportunity to go to Japan and start a, what was, would eventually be a venture backed, although at that stage it was an idea stage, um, internet service provider in, in Japan, but he didn't want to leave his family on a permanent basis. And so we were just chatting and, and I sort of explained that I just had this exit and he was, well, would you be interested in going basing out of Japan and we could do this together? And you could be the chief operating officer and I'll be the CEO and you can be there all the time and and, and I'll come in and yeah. give guidance, et cetera. And so I, I think the idea was, I liked the idea. It was actually from, it was technology that we were going to use to do this internet service provider. It was a free ISP called like Net Zero, if anyone has ever heard of that. And um, it was actually came out of Toronto. Okay. Um, and um, a guy called Chris Sikornik, who is still in the startup ecosystem now, uh, has a company called Disco. Uh, he, he was the young guy, very young guy at the mm -hmm. time, who had developed the software to be able to run this free ISP. So we um, we ended up. I ended up deciding. Okay, I'll go and I'll go and do that. Yeah. So that's what took me to Japan, and we decided to create this this free ISP. We it was my first real taste of venture capital. Ended up working. I mean, raising thirty million dollars, which was the biggest ever investment. It was a lot of it's a lot of money yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, from Texas Pacific, TPG, Texas Pacific Group. Right. A, a, a Japan? Uh, no, this is, they're, they're out of, TPG is still going strong. They're a, okay. a California-based, more, I guess, private equity, yeah. growth equity, private equity. They're still going strong now. And so ended up raising 30 million from them. And really, again, complete freedom. Hmm. Set up a, a brand new company from scratch. In Japan, I had a, a partner, another partner uh, of mine, a guy called Paul Davis, who was sort of my uh, my partner in pretty much everything we were doing, and uh, and then Keith, the former CEO of Bell South, sort of came up every two weeks, every every month, and we just said, right, we're going to build this, and the idea was we would build it. And then once we'd build it in Japan, we would then go and hire a local team and move on and do it in different parts. Right. Uh, but we started this in, we went live in 99. You know, I remember, uh, I remember being in Sydney for the millennium mm -hmm. and I, uh, Japan was a couple of hours behind Sydney and so I couldn't really celebrate the millennium until I think 2, 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. because that was midnight and yeah, I yeah. saw that everything had clicked over and everything was still working up yeah. in the, 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 the ISP, which we had launched in October. So, but that was, that was live. That was, that was Japan. Again, I, I didn't really see eye to eye with the VCs that we'd brought in mm. and after 18 months, there was, and, and we weren't, we, things were changing, you know, the, the bubble had now burst yeah. or we could see it yeah. coming. 
well, actually, not not quite, but but it 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 just hadn't the business hadn't was having many more challenges to launch than we thought, <clears throat> and so we hadn't gone to any other countries, and I sort of we agreed to part ways. It was relatively amicable, but we agreed to part ways. Yeah. They didn't see, they didn't believe in my vision. I didn't believe in theirs. And so after 18 months, be, I... Be, between you and the, the the Lifedoor team? Or you no, and me the, and the VCs. And, and, the VCs. <coughs> and, and, and what do you do with the 30 millions in these use cases? Are you giving them back? No, or? no, no. The, the business kept going. I okay. just left. Oh, okay, okay. I just left. Yeah. Um, I feel, I guess I was somewhat shown right that they... They ended up spending through $80 million dollars, mm -hmm. and uh, about two years later, ended up selling the company Live Door for, I think it was $1.2 million, to a gentleman called Hori Yeh-san, who uh, he himself has had a very interesting journey, uh, including spending some time in prison. But um, he he bought the company, and, and Live Door still exists mm -hmm. today. And I actually tried to bid against him to buy the company back, I think for like 600,000 or 800,000, but he ended up winning it and has turned it into publicly listed multi-billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. uh, Because you, you still believed into, into what the company was doing. Oh. I believed in the potential for it. Yeah. I just didn't believe in the way they were going about it. Yes. And, um, and so I left and That was really the thing that that sort of shifted me into venture capital because mm. it was the first time I'd really got an experience of what venture capital was about. A frustrating experience. A very frustrating experience. Oh, you know, uh, an exhilarating experience, mm. but also frustrating. Um, and the you know the the people who were sent to work with us hadn't didn't have any real operating experience. Yeah. They were. It was sort of MBA experience was regarded as enough, as opposed to it being an extra. It was just regarded as being enough. And so I left Japan and I went back to Hong Kong. I'd spent a lot of time. JMA, who I'd referred to before, yeah. was still living in Hong Kong. And so I went and, and I obviously I had the luxury of choice now because I'd had a, a couple of exits and went back to Hong Kong and said, right, I'm going to... I'm going to do better. I'm now going to become like, and I didn't even know the word at the time, so I didn't say it this way, yeah. but became an angel investor. And that's what happened. And as, as um, with this desire to become an angel investor, what do you want to do differently that your previous investors um, did? What, what were some of the things they said, I will not do the same mistakes. I'm going to do X, Y, Z. What were these X, Y, Z? I think one was listen to founders and uh, two was apply the knowledge that I'd experiential knowledge that I'd had. I felt that they didn't have exp they didn't have operating experience and without operating experience uh so a combination of not having operating experience and not listening those two things combined were the things that I most noted. And you know, if you had one or the other, perhaps it would have been okay. But not having, but both, you know, missing both was a real problem. Mm. And I guess I wanted to try and bring both to be able to to listen and to bring operating experience value add. So you are 32, uh, or 30, 32 yeah. at the time. Uh, you decided to become an angel investor. You create the um, Piermont Ventures. Yeah. Um, Which is a, like a booting investment firm, and and you, you your your thesis is basically that you want to invest only into uh, telecom um, companies at the time. Or no, because you... because Live Door was an internet company, mm. and so I would say I was broadly looking at tech. I was looking In at general. Okay, no, I was looking okay. at tech, uh, and there was um, a gentleman who I had worked with when I was in South Africa, mm. who was also now living in Hong Kong. Uh, he was a, a lawyer by background, and we'd, we'd spent a lot of time together when I was in South Africa negotiating contracts and agreements. And so I ended up, so he ended up joining, joining me at Piermont. And while we were focused on tech, you know, he was, he's again, cons, you know, quite a lot older than me. 
and had a lot of experience. And I spent a lot of time listening and learning about his experience. About And so although tech was the primary focus, we were also looking at funding models. How could we, in addition to angel investing, raise more money? And hadn't really considered raising a fund. Didn't feel like we were in a position to be able to raise a fund. Maybe we would have been, but again, just didn't know enough about it. And so we started looking at alternative funding models. And one of the alternative funding models that he was quite interested in was a process called securitization, okay. uh, where you take future revenues. Uh, well, the most, and sorry, I should say the most, the most obvious way is mortgages, where you someone will go out and sell or raise a number of mortgages. And then once they've raised those mortgages, they will bundle them all together. And then they will split them, split, split them into different tranches and yeah. sell them off. You know, the, the subprime mortgage was really all based on securitization. But this was the, that, that we were looking at this in, uh, in 2001. And so, it ended up that we did a lot of speaking to people about securitization as a potential form of a, a way of raising uh, raising capital. And uh, so in addition to the tech businesses, I did end up investing in a, in a mortgage-backed security company in Australia, which ended up being very successful, a company called Bluestone. But in addition to that, uh, but prime, uh, sorry, Apart from that, it was nearly all tech, mm. just uh, software, hardware, internet, mobile. So w w why at, at the time you, so it was uh, to, um, 2000 to uh, 2007 uh, years, right? So as you mentioned, the, the dot-com bubble burst it, right? Yep. So it, it seems like it was the worst time ever <laughs> to raise money to invest yeah. into companies, no? Yes, it was. I mean, uh, I so we started doing this in late 2000 mm. and made a few investments late 2000, early 2001, and then the bubble really burst. And so at that point, we said, okay, we have to stop investing and we need to look, move, go back to the operating. Is there companies that we can help? And so the subprime mortgage business was actually still doing really, really well. Okay. And they didn't need my help there. And I was sort of based out of prim primarily out of Hong Kong. But there was one company in Japan, a company uh, called Vogue Planet that I'd invested in that was really doing e-commerce for the fashion modeling and not e-commerce, we say, um, well, it was it was sort of a network for the fashion modeling industry, and so ended up going back to Japan and trying to turn that company into something else, and ended up shifting that company from an internet company into a television production and sports marketing company. The television production company we ended up selling about two years later to Fremantle Media. And it became Fremantle Media Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and the sports marketing company was where I managed to live my dreams vicariously through others, was organizing exhibition soccer matches wow. between professional European teams and, and teams in, uh, in, the, in the, the J League. Yes. And so that business was an amazing, again, amazing experience, but it wasn't very lucrative. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, but it was you know th those are the two things that we would I was doing because s s soccer started to really be very um, f f uh, I mean uh, oh, yes. in, in Japan it's really the years where uh, the, the, the yeah this was this really was now um, so we all we started that company in two thousand and three yeah. which was the year after the Japan Korea yeah. World Cup in two thousand and two I was. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Japan at that time, and so in 2003, yeah, we felt it was a was a really good time, and we partnered with a FIFA match agent, mm. and uh, and with him, f sort of formed this company called Football 360, and mm. uh, we were 
sort of the, the early days of organizing these massive matches. You see them now in North America. Yeah. We were doing the same thing in in Asia. Did you feel like it was an opportunity for you to reconcile two of your passions? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and why did this stop then? Uh, so the, there was a realization that it was harder to make, make it financially viable mm -hmm. than we thought. We, you know, we did a lot of research before we launched it. Yeah. Um, and, but that research was, and this is a, this is a big learning lesson. That research was one step removed from the actual people that had put on these types of matches before mm -hmm. in Japan. Most of our research had come from newspapers and, and and articles and interviews. And so what we did when we were putting together our business model, we looked at all of the announcements in the newspapers for all of the crowd attendances for all the previous matches. And so when we built our business model, which we went to the bank with, uh, Shinsei Bank, and they funded it, um, interestingly, the person who funded it actually, when he was at a previous banking experience, had done a lot of securitization of ticket sales for teams in Europe. So mm -hmm. he had an understanding of that, of securitization and an understanding of, of football. And so we sort of put our model together and it was funded and we arranged We, we, that, that first summer, we were just going to arrange three matches, one with Hamburg and two with Bayern Munich to, to bring and play. And after the, the first match uh, between Hamburg and Saitama and uh, Urawa Reds in Saitama, we realized we weren't selling enough tickets. And so what we ended up doing was towards the end to make sure that the in, mm. the environment was good, yeah. ended up giving away quite a lot of tickets to students and the such like. And it didn't dawn on me at that time, although it did after the next game, that when the newspapers announced how many people had come to the game, they included all the free tickets we'd given away. Oh. So the business model that we, so my assumption eventually was, oh my God, When, they, when I read those crowd numbers, they weren't all paying tickets. They had done the same thing that we had done. And so our business model was based on yeah. flawed numbers. Were you taking a, um, a percentage rate on, on the tickets? What, well, and the, you... I mean, it, it's, oh, look, it's an amazing industry. You, you end up negotiating with the, with the football team as mm -hmm. to how much you're going to pay them. Bayern Munich was the most amazing one. Yeah. Bayern Munich, I think at the time we were... We had to pay them a million euros a match, minimum of two yeah. matches. We had to charter a 747 Lufthansa to, to fly them in, put up them up in hotels, rent the stadium. And, and then it was sort of sponsorship and ticket sales yeah. to pay for it all. How much does it cost total to organize such event, right? To bring the Bayern to Munich, to Japan, to uh, rent the stadium, to... I would say uh, that... That one by Munich would probably have cost us, well, originally, I'll say what we originally, and that's an interesting way, it probably cost us about three and a half million euros, three, three and a half million euros. Okay. Uh, this is in yeah, yeah, 2002. Yeah. Uh, there is a, a documentary recently came out, which is about David Beckham. Yes. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. And there is a, a scene or a couple of scenes in there about when David Beckham first joins Real Madrid. Mm. And the very first thing, he, he joins Real Madrid and immediately gets on a plane to fly to Japan. Yes, because it was, he was a, like a, a He was legend there. Yeah. So they, Real Madrid had... And, and you, you were in Japan at this time, I was time, in Japan right? at this time. Yeah. So Real Madrid had not planned on coming to Japan. But as soon as David Beckham signed, they put in place a deal to come and play in Japan. And the irony of it was that the that they ended up agreeing to well, they ended up playing against FC Tokyo three days before 
the match that we had organized between Bayern Munich and FC Tokyo. And so our ticket sales, which were going really well, suddenly took a, a big yeah. hit to the point where I, um, I had to get on a plane and fly to Munich and negotiate. I ended up negotiating for anyone that knows anything about football. I was firstly speaking to a guy called Uli Hunis, which had played in, he used to play for Germany. And I told him we needed to sort of halve his rate from a million euros a match to half a million euros a match. And uh, he said, that's not going to work, but let me go and speak to someone. And he walked back in with uh, a guy called Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, who was the German captain at some point, uh, who I knew, you know, I was like, I could not believe that it was Karl-Heinz Rummenigge walking into yeah. the room in Munich. And he said, like, the best we can do is we'll drop it to 750,000 euros a match. And I was just in such a, a state of awe and shock. I just mm. said, yes. But we did manage to sort of just save our yeah. skin, just save our skin. But it, it sort of said, no, this isn't this isn't the business. This isn't this isn't the business for us. And I'd say the the television production business was starting to pick up. And yeah, and and the modding the the the, the modding aspect of of the uh, well, the modeling the aspect. So that was so what we did. That was the internet business, but yeah. we shifted it. And actually, the first TV show that we produced actually the only tv produ yeah. show we produced although we produced something like 36 episodes of it was a show called mirai right. model yeah. and mirai model is a, it's effectively japan's version of america's next top model yeah. and so we we leveraged all of that to produce that mm. tv show yeah. and uh, yeah it was broadcast on tv tokyo yeah. how, how was your experience as an outsider in in japan right because J japanese are not always very welcoming to uh, outsiders making mm. business in, in Japan. You felt like it was like clearly a disadvantage for you to to be an entrepreneur or to uh, to to have this project, or did you feel like you you were Asian enough at at the time to? Um... No, it was I, I I I was very much an outsider. I didn't really speak Japanese. Um, and it was not an advantage. It was mm -hmm. definitely a disadvantage. I would say if if I look for any advantage, it was that there was an appreciation by the Japanese for things from outside of Japan, particularly North America, mm -hmm. Northern Europe. There wasn't real appreciation, well, Europe, there was an appreciation for that. And in fact, we were bringing something in from there. I think did feel different. They felt, oh, this is coming from the outside, yeah. and and they were very familiar. There was more and more Japanese TV shows heading into Europe. Yeah. I mean, Dragon's Den is is a Japanese TV show. I uh, didn't know that. Yeah, okay. it is, and uh, so I think they were recognizing they could send stuff out. So it was interesting to come back in, but no, it was very difficult. But they are they are a very they're a very respectful and warm people, mm -hmm. very generous in so many ways. Yeah. And so I always knew I was an outsider, but they, were, they still made me feel uh, worthy. Hmm. So... At, the, at this time, right, you, you 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 spent most of your career trying um, collaborating with UK companies, trying to open offices in all Asia, focusing on Japan, being in the in this um, in this media uh, and telecom uh, industry, right? What led you to go and in Canada and to change uh, continents? Uh, well, that one is easy. My my now wife. So I was in Japan, I'd been there for on and off five years. And uh, my business, one of my business partners, um, he actually used to be, he's an Australian, and he used to be a former fashion model. And he knew many people in that, that industry. And there were a lot of uh, non-Japanese working in that industry. And uh, one of them happens to be my now wife. So I met her when I was in Japan 
and we sort of decided that we were going to spend a life together and I had just sold the last business in Japan. She had been there for almost 12 years. She was ready to leave and um, she said I could follow her here and so I did. Was it a transformative uh, experience to leave everything you knew? Again, because as you mentioned, right, it was your home now in, in a sense, right? You, yeah. you, uh, you blended within the, the culture. Going to North America, coming to the Montreal cold. How, how are the, <coughs> the, 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 the transition between uh, yeah. those two worlds? Well, again, I, I, like it seems as I'm telling you this story, my life feels like it's filled with the ignorance or the, the bliss of ignorance. But firstly, I didn't realize how French Montreal was. And I think, and, and, um, my wife's, my wife is French is a mother, mother language and the family all obviously are all speaking French all the time. That is, that is their language. And so I knew that my wife could speak French. I didn't know that's what she did all day because I'd only ever met her in Japan and it was an international community and everyone was speaking English. And so when I first came here, uh, and and the first I, the first day I arrived here was uh, December the twenty seventh, and I had bought your, I, your birthday, right? Uh, the twenty fifth is the my 25th, birthday. Okay. Yeah, but the, the, I I had bought winter clothes in England because I knew it was going to be a bit colder. But when I like my my winter jacket was a thin piece of cotton that had a furry collar. Mm. It had a furry collar, so that made all the difference. And so I arrived, and I'm like, "Oh, I knew it was cold, but I didn't realize it was this cold." Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, I went to my uh, my in laws' house to meet them, and uh, my wife's brother and sister and their partners were there as well. And I was sitting down, and everyone was speaking French. I'm like, "Oh." It's not that they can, it's yeah. that they do. And I, I, again, I do, I feel somewhat ignorant of that now. But so, so for me, I actually thought finally, I'm going to a country where I can speak the language and I'm a salesperson yeah. and this is going to be great. Yes. So it wasn't, the weather was not the thing that sort of struck me the most. That did hit me over the next couple of winters until I actually just bought some decent winter gear, which changes everything. Yeah. It was more the language. It was, it was quite shocking. Mm. And it was at a time where I'm not sure if, if I've now just become accustomed or things are different, but you couldn't buy many of the things that I wanted to buy, particularly electronics, mm. because they didn't have a French version of it. Oh, I see. And there was there was a number of rules and laws which at the time yeah. was struck me as, as I, I guess I understood, my father-in-law was great at explaining, you know, the reason that we are where we are. And I, I, I got to really understand the Quebec history from him. But it did, find, it did strike me that there was uh, something a little, that, that was holding us back through the language side of things. So, uh, but yeah, it was, um, it was one of those things where I did realize I was going to have to put in a couple of years. And we had, a, I had a conversation with, with my wife and it was, I mean, she was saying, Hey, if, if, if you don't want to, if you don't want to, if you want to go somewhere else for another couple of years, you can like, we can do no problem. Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, that's fine, but are you going to want to come back? And she's like, yes, well, I will want to, of course I want to come back. Yeah. And I said, well, okay, I know there is no point going and trying to build something somewhere else. This is where it has to be. And, uh, and, and there was no room for negotiation to go in Toronto, for example, where it would be close enough, but you were, you'll be in a more English uh, speaking environment. Uh, well, my, my wife would have. My wife would have gone anywhere, I think, for a couple of years, but she would always want to come back to Montreal. Back Montreal yeah. And and I already I'd already sort of fallen in love with her family and and 
this was a commitment. So no, this is it. And uh, I think the thing that changed it was I came, we were staying at her parents still. And the thing that changed it was I just said, okay, you know what? I'm going to go and, uh, and learn French. And I didn't tell them that I was going to do it. And um, so I, I signed up to do a 10 weeks intensive French. Nice. I was still a bit nervous and this is just a sort of, I still remember how strange, how I felt at the time. And this is a strange thing to say, but I ended up going and doing 10 week intensive French, but I did it at McGill. Hmm. Not University de Montréal, but McGill. Yeah. Now, why would I go to McGill? There was still this sense of, okay, this will be easier. I can I can ease in because yeah. there was still this fear of French. But anyway, that that commitment to do it, and when I told my mother in law, she was she was very happy. So, so made a, a big reveal at some point. You you, you came and you, you were speaking French. French well, French. no, I just told them that I'd signed up and they oh, needed okay. to drop me off at school every day. <laughs> I, I, actually, I told them uh, they wanted me to get a job, and I said, "No, I'm not going to get a job. I'm going to go and do ten yeah. weeks intensive French." Yeah. So. year of travel mm. um i took my wife elise down to new zealand where i'd grown up a lot of my life mm. and so showed her a little bit of that um spent some time at the 2006 world cup in germany uh but it was then sort of coming back end of 2006 um and sort of then thinking okay what's next mm. and what's next really started over the Christmas period, 2006 going into 2007, yeah. and uh, that's where that's where I guess my new life really started. Yeah, you you didn't have any connection already at at the time, right? Besides your your, your no, your my my uh, my father-in-law was a doctor. My mother-in-law was a yeah. was a teacher. My my brother-in-law was in the army, and my sister-in-law was a social worker yeah. there was no business networks at all uh you know amazing people who all give so much to society but mm. they weren't in a position to sort of help me yeah. on the business side the only that the, and so i made it up and what i made up was there was a connection this gentleman jma that i've referred to before mm. in hong kong he had a company which had a venture capital investor. And it so happened that the venture capital investor, I had met him once. Um, he, uh, his, his VC firm was sort of based between Boston and Montreal. And he had a partner who was based out of Montreal. And I'd never met the partner, but I knew that that partner's fund had invested in my friend JMA's company. And so I, and he knows this story, so I can tell it now. His, this is Alan McIntosh. And so I found, I, I sent him an email and said that this, the other partner of his had said that, um, you know, if I was in Montreal, I should look him up. And he hadn't said that. Hmm. And I found out from Alan about maybe 18 months later, we were having a discussion and he said, Ah, so you did make that up because it was very strange because I didn't really see eye to eye with that other partner. And I'd be very surprised that he would ever have sort of suggested that mm. you should have reached out to me. So, uh, so no, I didn't have any connections at all. Didn't know anyone at all. Uh, the closest I had was a, a friend of a friend of a friend. And yeah. that was, that was, it was Alan. So Alan was a was my first contact person in business. And so you're going to Alan say, and, and you said, let's start something together? Or? Well, I just said, hey, let's just catch up. And we talked yeah. and um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I felt like I was pretty unemployable, particularly given that I didn't speak French, but I was probably unemployable mm -hmm. anyway now that I'd been running my own stuff for so many years. And so my first meeting with him 
I actually think the first meeting with him may have been at the end of 2006, uh, Café Souvenir up on in, um, in Outremont. And it was just a chat, just to catch up. Alan and I, the big connection that Alan and I had was through the mobile industry. He was very much into the mobile industry, so was I. And we knew a couple of people who knew. He knew Ethos. He had heard of Ethos. He had actually, I think, tried to invest in Ethos um, just before we got acquired, like the company I was running in Asia. So I think he'd heard of me. So we'd sort of just talked about that. And I sort of said, I don't know what I'm doing next. He was, so there was, it was just a conversation. And we agreed that we'd meet up in the new year. And it was, it was the second meeting where, I thought to myself, I need to have an idea this time. And so what had happened between the first meeting late 2006 or early 2007 and the second meeting, which was probably in March, um, was that I had started a blog uh, and I really just wanted to play around with WordPress. And so I started a blog. And the blog was called montrealstartup.com. I also registered vancouverstartup.com and torontostartup.com and just started a blog. And the way I described it, it was a Lonely Hearts column for someone in the tech industry. My very first post, uh, which actually happened, I think, 17 years ago last week, very first post said in English, Hi, I'm new in Montreal, and uh, I'm interested in these things, these things, these things, uh, looking to build something, don't want to do it on my own, so look forward to connecting. Yeah. And uh, I was, in fact, you know, I know where we're recording this now. I was just across the street from where we're recording this. And um, despite my wife believing that perhaps no one would read my blog, 48 hours later, I actually, uh, there's a, a gentleman, a guy called Harry, who had a, his own blog at the time. He actually sort of commented on it and said, hey, nice to have you in town. Why don't you come along next week to the second ever Montreal Tech Breakfast? This is so weird. How did he found your I have no your idea. Article? Uh, no idea. Did you publish uh, it somewhere? Uh, yeah. Well, this is on our, my blog. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's just a blog. I mean, but y- Google. Y- there was no LinkedIn at the time. Uh, I mean, I, there, there was LinkedIn, but you, yeah, did no. you no. No, it was just it was just a blog, just MontrealStartup.com. He probably had some search terms or something, and so he invited me to come along to that tech breakfast, and I went. And at that time, I didn't know whether I was going to do more angel investing or whether I was yeah. going to do another startup. And there were twelve people at the tech breakfast. And I realized they were all a bit younger than me and the energy and the passion and the ideas. And I'm like, oh, but th- there was a lot of talk around, there is no money. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, now I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to stick on the angel investing side. And that angel investing side, I met a guy called uh, Daniel Drouet, I think at that, pre- uh, well, that was also another introduction as uh, Sylvain Carl, Daniel Drouet. Mm-hmm. These two people were very friendly and open and they were into into Wi-Fi at the time, which was sort of an extension of my cellular. I was very interested in Wi-Fi. And um, Danielle and I started talking and he he sort of said, hey, have you heard about this thing called Y Combinator? And we looked at it, talked about it. It looked very interesting. So then when I went back and had my second meeting with Alan, I had something to talk about and it was, hey, what if we did something similar to Y Combinator. Yeah. But so it's interesting, right? Because th- your first um, venture experience, I would say, was during the dot com uh, yeah. uh, 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 crash era, right? Your second one, 2007, <laughs> was during the global financial crisis as well. Well, the, the financial crisis really kicked off in 2008. And I would say the financial crisis was very much catalyzed by subprime mortgages. Yes. Now, I had sold out of my subprime mortgage business in 2006. I see. So, 
And I will say that subprime mortgage business that I invested in was a very healthy business. It mm. was not a business that ever caused any problems, and it actually managed to keep going. And um, the guy that founded it, a guy called Alistair Jeffrey, was an amazing guy. So, so uh, this is now 2007. So it's actually still uh, – there's still a belief in – this is really about the shift in the cost of starting yeah. a company. That was really happening 2006, 2007. Yeah. And so I would say 2008 was around the corner. We didn't know it was coming. Yeah. And I would say we were fortunate that we, uh, well, in some cases, we were fortunate that we raised our fund, our first fund, Montreal Startup, $5 million in 2007. We were unfortunate that we did make a couple of investments into that got impacted by that. Mm. But most of the time, we were investing such little money in, yeah. in businesses, which really in the internet, it didn't really impact it too much. Yeah. So it's, it's um, 2007, 2008. <clears throat> you, you are 40-ish at, at the time, right? Um, you um, you are seeing YC Combinator growing up and being su successful, right? And you you want to replicate this model. Um, and so is this is it when you you start to put in place <coughs> what you were calling this Thunder Fuel program within Montreal Startup that mm. many years after became the Thunder Fuel that we know. But at yeah. the time you had this model of providing those twenty five fifty uh, k to uh, small teams and to see what they can achieve within a four months period? It, it wasn't quite like that. Um, you know, in 2007, to when, I f when we first came across uh, Founder Fuel, sorry, about a, 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 across Y Combinator, um, and I actually went down to Boston because they had the Y Combinator demo day. They did mm -hmm. one in, in there where Gary Tan, who is the now CEO, was actually... His company, Posturus, was going through that. So, so it wasn't, this was not at a time when Y Combinator was successful. It was mm -hmm. just that Y Combinator was different. And it it was about, it, it just told us the message of you can find entrepreneurs and you can use less money than you thought, which suited our thinking because we were looking at a small, you know, raising of money here was mm -hmm. been difficult. So it was more just about there was a new model. Uh, it wasn't that it was successful at that time. It was just that it was a new model. Um, and so, but when we went to, when we went to launch, we actually ended up, you know, going through a process. Investors Mont Quebec had a program uh, called the Fonds Soutien. And we ended up um, sort of asking for the Fonds Soutien then to, to, mm. to invest in our fund that was focused on the island of Montreal. But at that time, when we looked at Y Combinator and then very soon afterwards we saw Techstars, we recognized that it was really all about mentors. It was very much mentors. Mm -hmm. And Montreal just didn't have the depth that we felt to be able to do a program like that. Mm -hmm. And the depth of mentors, the depth of advisors. And so we ended up just doing what I would say was a almost looks like an angel fund. We didn't do an accelerator. We did register in 2007, we registered founderfuel.com mm. because that was the name that we thought, but we didn't launch founderfuel until 2011. Yes. And so, because we just didn't think the ecosystem was ripe. And so the founderfuel was launched in 2011, just after we raised our second $50 million fund, mm. at which point we had been doing, there'd been a more and more activities, um, Phil Tellio, who's famous for startup, for the startup fest at that time, he and another partner of his were doing things like um, startup camp, which was events and activities, and uh, you know, with with my other hat on, I was starting to think about, hey, do we need a permanent physical location to capture the energy that's happening at these startup events, and that that resulted that was Notman House, and we can touch base on that. But uh, it was so it was only really until 2011 we felt that there was enough of an ecosystem to be able to support 
our own accelerator. Mm. And so that's when we raised $50 million, we launched Notman House and we launched Founder Fuel. Yeah. So is Real Venture a rebranding of uh, Montreux? Okay. Yeah. But it was basically the same team, the same thing, just a, uh, a rebranding? Pretty much the yeah. same team. And we we had a, a couple of tweaks. We, we um, uh, Danielle, Danielle sort of moved to a, an advisory role but he'd been very involved. He and I were the mm. two people that really did Montreal Startup. And we brought in a gentleman called Mark McLeod uh, to come and work with Alan McIntosh and JS, John Sebastian Cornway mm. and I. So, and it was a rebranding and it, it's a rebranding. The reason because Montreal Startup, we were only investing on the island of Montreal, literally the island. So it was your TVs. That, that well, mm. it was also the restriction of the capital we had. But it made sense because where else are there going to be internet companies? Like it was there. But when we raised our next fund, we were going beyond the island of Montreal, even pushing into Ontario. So we had to change the name and we dropped the Mont mm. and kept the real. Ah. That's that's why we're Real Ventures. Ah, interesting. So obviously, the name Real says many things. Yeah, yeah. But no, that is why that is why we I, are called I, Real I, Ventures. I never realized. Okay. Yeah. It's it's super. so. In so you are it's um, two thousand um, two 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 thousand um, I would say now, uh, ten. Yep. Right. Um, you, you do the the rebranding. You already had a, a couple of funds with Montreal Startup. Or we just one? won. Just one, one. Right. So you are ready to um, to have your second found. What are you saying to the LPs um, in terms of what are you going to do differently than uh, other um, VC firm that were in in the in the place at, at the time? Well, uh, you know, the first fund w was really based on money that came from Investors Mont Quebec yeah. and from the 5DQ. There was a guy called Jacques Bernier who now has his own fund called Terralis, mm. but he was at the FSDQ. And it was, so it was really, it was seen as an economic development fund. In 2010, there was uh, some work done, particularly led by Gilles de who who recognized that, or, or she would say there was a recognition at the government level that more needed to be done for venture capital. And so they ran a program or a, I guess, a, a competition, Concor, for f potential fund managers to apply to run one of three fond amassage seed funds. Mm. One was in the ICT space, one was in clean tech space, and one was in life sciences. And so we actually, and that that was 42 and a half million. You had to raise eight million of private capital, but they would provide the rest of the capital because there really was no one else. There was very few, the very few, there was a couple of firms around. Um, I think the only one that still exists is an, is Anovia, although it wasn't called Anovia at the very early days. Other funds around actually don't exist anymore. Yeah. And, and so- And Innovia was not focused on seeds uh, investment too much at the time in any way, right? It was more series, it would have yeah, regarded so series A. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it was Series A yeah. um, at the time. So th there was really no one. For, there was no one for, for seed. Uh, no one for yeah. seed, yeah. and so they, they and we. So we bid on that, and we won. We won the bid, and so we decided that actually we wanted to invest beyond Quebec. We thought it was important to do that. Mm -hmm. So we ended up raising fifty million, and we could invest anything over the. I think over the 42 million, I think we could invest yeah. outside of Quebec if we wanted to. And so the um, this was the this was the, the shift of of going and uh, mm -hmm. and now having a, a fund that we could we could invest in. So when when we looked at what was the story we told them, it it wasn't about why are we better. It was more why should because there was nothing to be better than. Yeah. Um, it was how how do we think about it? And the fact that we had done so much work as the Montreal startup team, and um, 
and that we had the idea of launching Founder Fuel, mm. um, that they recognized that from um, an economic development and ecosystem development point of view, I think this is what they recognized, uh, that we were genuine, authentic, I guess real, <laughs> that, that we actually did want to try and really shift the startup ecosystem. And so that was the catalyst mm. for what we told them. What, what was the maturity level of the tech ecosystem at the time? Do you feel like there were a lot of interesting f investment opportunities? Or do you feel like it was still into those early days of uh, the ecosystem trying to put itself in place? And yeah. It was, there were, there were a growing number of opportunities, but no, it was still very, very early days. Yeah. It was very early days. Um, you know, like, I don't know that there were really any second time founders. Yeah. Um, and there was very few follow on investors. You know, it was, it was, we were, I do think it, we felt very much felt yeah. like we were, we were on our own. Yeah. So the, the mentoring needs was, uh, legit, right? I mean, it was a, a lot of, of Absolutely. those young bold and uh, this new generation of entrepreneurs were really now um, fueled by a lot of um, opportunities as well it was way more easier to create a tech company right there was uh, there was um, much more tools and solutions out Absolutely. there for them um, so SaaS and all the the e-commerce platform were uh, way more uh, in uh, Consumers were much more used to um, to, to the e-commerce um, websites and to, yeah. uh, to to the SaaS models, right? So yeah, it, it, it there was the, the the market, the consumer market was ready for such products. The 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 new generation didn't have uh, didn't need to your point, right? To have those hundreds of millions or ten millions to start yeah. a company, right? With Alpha million, you were able to uh, find product market well, fit already. Yeah, maybe even. Yeah, even, even less. <laughs> even but less. Yeah. but the, the point is that it was like a, a pivotal time as well from uh, an, an, an entrepreneurial and. Um, uh, absolutely. Point, right? Yeah, I think the thing that, you know, that Paul Graham and Y Combinator had seen in 2006 was now being widely accepted yeah. or starting to be accepted of the, the cloud computing and uh, as you said, SaaS business model. So it was yeah. definitely like, it was definitely like that. But, uh, and I would say, you know, this was time of the lean startup, the methodologies, the, the Silicon Valley practices were now more and more were being on show, more and more blogs, more and more insights. I would say we were we were somewhat the translators of that that message uh, from Silicon Valley and bringing it into Montreal, Canada, um, <coughs> particularly particularly Montreal. We, that's what we were really doing. We were the translator. But if I look at the if I look at the companies that we invested out of that fund. Many of the most successful companies were actually companies that came through Founder Fuel, mm. and I think the fact that that is the case is is revealing as to what the ecosystem was really like. I mean, Founder Fuel companies were taking, you know, we were investing fifteen, twenty five thousand, fifty thousand dollars into these companies. Mm. Anyone that was taking that type of money was not a second time founder; they didn't have the experience. So if, if, if we are talking, so just looking at now and the overview of real ventures, right? So um, some of the numbers that I have here, it's, so basically you had like four founds. Yeah, to, I mean, let's just, yes. Yeah. Um, so you closed four, four Let's founds. say four vintages. So yes. 2007, yeah. then 2011, 2014, 2017. Yeah. You, 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 you close a total of three... Uh, 320 million uh, over the, the span of, of, of those years. You invested around um, 120 companies. 
Uh, if you include all the founder ones, I'd say it's more 220. 220 companies. Okay. What what would you say is so the the, the percentage of those companies that were coming from Thunder Fuel versus the non Thunder Fuels um, uh, cohorts? Uh, so, well, we've ran 14 cohorts of Founder Fuel, and I would say, let's say, probably an average of eight companies. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at a hundred and ten. Yeah. So half but, half of the companies but, but, came from Founder Fuel. But, but but from an investment amount ratio, I'm, because oh, and, I mean hardly. Was, uh, yeah. I think we've only ever invested, but well, probably less than ten million dollars. Ten to uh, at the most fifteen million of that three hundred and thirty million yeah. would have been in the initial Founder Fuel investments. Yeah, yeah. We do do follow on investments into Founder Fuel companies, yeah. but in terms of the initial. So it's almost the the the, the Pareto uh, rules, right? Yeah. You, you you invested twenty percent of your uh, the amount you raised into eighty percent of the companies you invested into. In, in this case. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not quite that the Pareto, but yes, I mean, um, it's yeah, it is it is not much of the capital went into those companies at the earliest stages. Yeah, and I think that's the. That's the beauty. That's the model. That's the that's the model that that seems to seems to work. You know, when it comes to fund sizes, always just trying to get that balance mm. right is uh, is 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 quite important. Yeah. So, I, I would like to talk a little bit about being a board member, right? So, mm. at the time, you had the opportunity to be in many different boards. Which is another variation of being a mentor, uh, I, I would say, right? Uh, but at at, a, at a, another level. So, you you have been at again. Let let's stay within those years of um, 2010, um, 2014. Um, you have been to the board of Beyond the Rack, which was one uh, e-commerce e company. You have been at the board of Unsplash, Breather. Um, so, how so? What was your experience of being a board member, right? Because it was, again, your first time uh, being at, at the board. How do you approach mentoring, supporting companies as a board member at, at the time, at least? Yeah, at the time, which again, I would say perhaps is a different perspective than I yeah. have now. But at the time, um, I think, I guess at the time, I I did what, I'd set out to do, which is I tried to listen and I tried to provide my operating advice. And what that means is, uh, <laughs> I guess I was listening for what I liked and what I didn't like, as opposed to just listening. Mm. I was looking, listening for what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, I would say I, I certainly was someone who was not afraid to speak my opinion, to share my opinion, and again, probably willing to share my opinion beyond uh, beyond the value of that opinion. But I, I, I really, I was there. I think I, I think the thing that was most important at those times is that because we were a seed investor, and particularly those companies that you talked about that very soon after, because I had no more money, I became very aligned with with the founders. I, I became aligned in terms of like financing I, because I was going to get diluted mm. just like they were going to get diluted. And I, I had seen them at their, I guess, uh, entrepreneurial nascence mm. and their they knew that I had invested into them or we had invested, but in terms of me being the board representative, that I'd invested, in them, invested into them at a point where it wasn't clear that they were warranting investment. Mm. And I think that that definitely meant that we could have a relationship with founders, which was quite different than follow-on investors. Mm. 
I'd say also though there and was you, a you, you're almost a good father in in a, in a way, right? Uh, you you believed in them when they didn't prove anything yeah. yet. You are you were here in the most challenging and stressful times. Yeah, uh, it's it's way more comfortable to be an investor later on uh, when product market fit is found, where there, there's like an operating system in place, kind of in within the company and. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean the, when you you're right when you're when you're investing at a slightly later stage you can't be exclusively investing in the people because yeah. you do actually have to do the due diligence on it and yeah. on everything else. At our stage we were really just doing the due diligence on the people. Yes. And we had looked at them. We had measured them yeah. and you know they had they'd come up good. Yeah. And I think people sort of remember that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a human-centric investment more than a product or market investment, Well said, right? exactly. And I feel like as, as an entrepreneur, feeling that you are investing into me as a person and not, you are not investing into my uh, EBITDA or my product or my market is very different, right? It's not the same relationship as you mentioned, right? That's right. So... Uh, when such a bond is created between an investor and an entrepreneur at this time, how did the relationship evolve when now the company is growing and go seek uh, Series A, extra? <laughs> you feel like it's your child is living at their own in a sense, or you know, it falls. There's generally the it sort of falls on into two camps. One camp is the camp where the bond that you formed, maybe you've done a good job at really building deep trust and that you continue to be a trusted advisor, whether you're on the board or not, uh, or maybe not even a trusted advisor, just a confidence, just someone you can talk to about stuff. Um, so I think that, that that's one way the relationship goes. Another way the relationship goes, and that's normally if you haven't done an amazing job at building trust, or if sometimes the founders just, you know, have heard too many stories or had too many life experiences where um, trust isn't isn't how they operate. They're thinking just more about value exchange, yeah. and in that case, you know, like if you're not putting more money in, you become less relevant. And, you know, I certainly have went been through and I've seen some of my partners go through some quite tough emotional times in terms of, you know, being what feels like pushed out, um, no longer, no longer matter. Mm -hmm. You know, you've mattered for a very long yeah. time and now you're not heard, you're not spoken to, you're not heard from. There is an assumption you've got no value to add or you don't have as much value. They shouldn't be listening to you. They should be listening to the person that wrote the biggest check, the next check in. Mm. You know, so, you know, woe is our life. It's not, it's, it's not like that. But it is, it is a challenge yeah. to navigate that the first time or two. Yeah. Do you ever envision to maybe follow them in their journey and after doing um, seed investment, trying to say, okay, now we are going to do series A and maybe after the series B and trying to follow those cords of investment more than staying always at the uh, entrance of the, the funnel? Entry. Well, I, I, there's two parts to that. So firstly, like we have invested at, at we have done follow on mm, investments yeah. into series A and follow on series B, maybe even series C. Mm. And um, I've, I've sat and do sit on um, many series B boards and the odd series C. Uh, so from that perspective, I, we do follow, but in terms of actually leading the original investment, you know, first check in at the yeah. series A, series B, series C, just no, no interest at all. Mm. Uh, it, it, it is, as you said, it's, I, I really 
really love that idea of being there close to the inception yeah. and to just come in later just doesn't resonate yeah. doesn't resonate with how i it's more operational maybe maybe more um it's there is um yeah it is i guess it's it's more operational it's more it's more what do i want the conversation to be about and from a due diligence point of view mm. you know once once I'm on any board, I actually enjoy being on most, nearly all boards. Uh, but it's how am I going to start a conversation with someone? How am I going to engage a conversation with someone? Yeah. And engaging that conversation around things which are not people-centric is, is not something that I enjoy the forming of the relationship mm. that way. What it is to be a board observer? So you have been a board observer on on some some companies, including Breather, for example. Mm. Do you feel like powerless in a sense? Do you feel only um, a spectator and not on playing on the field in, in a sense? Or? Well, so you know, a, an observer that depends on the actual board itself. In some cases, being a board observer is like being a board member in terms of your level of engagement. You are treated like a board member. You get all the information like a board member. And so the only thing is you don't just put your hand up when it's, you don't sign the documents. Mm. Now, the other is where there is a, maybe there's a lot of observers. And in that case, you are sort of designed to be a little quieter. But I would say for me, being an observer has help me listen better mm. not originally but but the more and more listen better it's it's an opportunity to not feel that you need to do anything and that causes you to take a step back and listen more so i would say the if the role of as an observer particularly one that's known the founder for a long time and i think this is now more and more how i think and how the team at real thinks is that we have an opportunity to to be much more listeners and I guess full sense listeners, not just listening with your ears, but actually trying to understand what is the energy, the dynamic that is existing around this yeah. conversation. So if, if you could go back 10 years in, in the past and whisper something to John Sear uh, before he's, he's starting this uh, experiencing what uh, being part of a board is, what would you tell him? Um, I think I would say it's all about trust and if you have trust, any ideas and any thoughts that you want to share have a much, much higher chance of having an impact. And so to build that trust just make sure that you listen and listen and listen and reflect back what you're hearing. Turn off your own mind. Mm. Turn off your own mind and really try and listen, full-bodied listen to what it is that the other person is saying. Did, did you felt like you, you were not trusting the funders enough or do you feel like it was your mandate to come up with very candid feedback and bringing value to the table and you felt like listening was not bringing value? Well. I think I think that I thought that being direct was earning me trust. Mm -hmm. And I thought that finding commonalities in lived experience and sharing those commonalities was also building trust. Yeah. So and it, and I would say in many cases it was uh, if I look at founder fuel in particular, you know, I'm spending three or four months with people who, when you spend that l long time, you get to under, you have an opportunity to see beyond the surface. And I think 
people that had an opportunity to see beyond the surface, they they knew that I had their best interests in heart, which was the generation of yeah. trust. But, and w once they had that trust, what they loved was the direct feedback, the willingness to to express something because it was they they knew that it was in their best interest. But people that haven't had a chance to get to know you, haven't had that those months, then direct feedback isn't necessarily the way to build trust. Um, it's, as I said, it's more about listening and making sure they feel heard. Well, because they are being heard. And I think that, that, that if you want to build a relationship of trust with someone very quickly, best thing to do is listen turn off your thoughts and repeat back to them their thoughts yeah it's it's really interesting um and i'm going to uh, to elaborate on that as 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 a french mm -hmm. coming into the quebec and canadian culture i definitely see that i can be sometimes very direct right uh and maybe more blunt than um what people people around me could uh, could uh, expect, I yeah. would say. Yeah. And I always believe that being direct, being blunt, pr with respect always, right? But providing candid feedback and but trying to be a no bullshit type of person, mm -hmm. we're providing a type of trust and respect, right? If you are, if you 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 feel like you can tell me the harsh truth or telling me that something is is not going right, and I it's, it's mean that you, you trust me. You you are thinking of my best interest, right? Where sometimes being just a listener feel like you are not active into the relationship, right? You mm -hmm. are more passive. It's obviously there's, there's those active listening type of of, uh, of mindset, but yeah. I and when I was talking with some of your Thunder Fuel uh, uh, course, right, and I was asking what the experience was to, to be part of Thunder Fuel, one of the common things that they were saying is that meeting with you was scary to them, right? Mm. But it pushed them always because they knew that they were going to face someone who were going to be noble, <laughs> going to just tell them the truth. And just go straight to the point and not waste time. And I feel like this this aspect of your personality was definitely, at least from my per, uh, distance point of view, but was one of your uh, your personal branding mm. uh, assets, yep, I would absolutely. say, right? And yep. what made you different from many other of your counterparts and, 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 and teammates. So, how much did you feel like this nature of being direct, of being sometimes uh, blunt, how, how much did you feel it was part of your personality and you had to embrace this versus trying to reflect that, no, I, I need to be different. I need to be more into a listening mode and to be more uh, welcoming and respectful. How did you manage those two aspects of uh, well, I would say the idea of being in listening mode, and that's actually the phrase that I use, listening mode or learning mode, uh, is not something that I consciously thought about, uh, I would say, until probably four or five years ago. Mm. Prior to that, uh, if I reflect on it, but it was... It was all about how quickly can we get things done? How quickly, how, how, what is the shortest period of time I can listen in order to feel like I've got something I can add? So it was very much about yeah. speed. I think that came also with an expectation that I was supposed to say something smart very quickly. And so it was like, how quickly can we move? How quickly can we move? And I still think that that that's possible. But being a more active listener actually allows you to listen at multiple levels. Yeah. And I 
think that learning to listen at multiple levels allows you to then, when you are direct, to perhaps communicate on multiple levels, to communicate both intellectually and emotionally at the same time. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, listen on both levels, you can communicate on both levels. If you can't listen at both, I say both, multiple levels, if you can't listen at multiple levels, then how can you communicate at multiple levels? Mm-hmm. So I do. I did like being direct, and I had no fear. But I think the other thing was, most of the time, most of the time, I truly had their best interests at heart, yeah. and directness was my way of conveying my interest in them. However, there were definitely must that there have been times many 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 times too many times where uh my direct communication was more being expressed from a position of frustration that it wasn't as i wanted it to be than from a position of um of hope and desire for the other person and knowing the difference I think is the big difference. Yeah. Um, yeah, knowing the difference. You you wrote on fighting against pet theories. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on what are pet theories and what you believe are the best way to not fall into the, the, those traps? Yeah. So, pet theories really came up from um, board board meetings and. It was something that we discussed around the table at Real Ventures uh, about how to improve board meetings. And one of the the biggest the, one of the biggest issues of board meetings is time sunk time sunk on things which perhaps are are not front and center, not material. And <clears throat> These things normally came up and it's normally one person has a specific idea. Perhaps it's based on their history, based on their past. And it's their own pet theory about why something isn't going right or why it is going right or how things need to change. And so this idea of a pet theory was something which really needed to to listen to and understand how, how can you... And, and sorry, if you don't address the pet theory, then the the person will just keep bringing it back, keep on bringing it back, and keep on sucking time. Um, and so the, the idea was, how can you, before board meetings, actually speak to people about what it is that they think is going wrong in a one-on-one basis, and unpack their own pet theory? And you do this before the board meeting. And once you've unpacked it, you need to sort of, you go away, you do your research and you find out like, is there any relevance to it? And if you think actually that that this pet theory is something which is relevant to the whole group, then you go back and tell the person, you know what, I appreciate you sharing that. It is relevant. I'm going to put this as an agenda item and we're going to discuss it within this context. Sometimes it's not. And in that case, You've done the work to listen to that pet theory, and then you go back and you have another conversation in which you communicate beforehand why it is that perhaps that theory isn't quite relevant, and that this is why, and provided that they feel that you've addressed it, that we don't want to address it in the board meeting. It's all about doing the work beforehand to speed up the whole movement of the of the board meeting. Yeah. What... <clears throat> What what is the opposite of a good board meeting? <clears throat> I think a, a a a bad board meeting is one in which no no challenging opinions are voiced and where and or where challenging opinions lead to a breakdown in communication and it becomes it becomes a, a battling around the the content of 
who's right. Um, and this is where I think, you know, we'll come back to the observer. The observer role, and I'd mean this, I guess, in life, one who is an observer who's sitting in a meeting that perhaps isn't supposed to talk. You know, often people will check out when they're an observer and they're not part of the conversation. But an observer has a role to play of what is the context, what is the dynamic that's at play here? And stepping into when you recognize, ah, oh, there's a dynamic at play where people think they're talking about the content, but actually they're not. They're just talking about their their they're talking about the their own fears and their own nervousness. And I think a, a sort of a a bad board meeting is where the conversations are all really about individuals' fears, anxieties, and worries disguised as facts and content and and figures and numbers and analysis. So you probably went into some of those bad board uh, meetings, right? How do you react after that? Are you going back to the um, CEOs providing feedback about efficient of this meeting how do you make it better for the next time how do you make sure that you can nav you can try to to provide a, something that resonates to other board members say for them maybe to put their ego aside or trying to go back to what really matter how do you transition uh, from bad meeting to good meeting mm. well i think at the assuming that the ceo is running the meeting Uh, then I think it is doing the work beforehand to help them increase their level of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, because a, a CEO is has a lot of pressure on them. They probably have a lot of pressure on them to get sucked into the content as opposed to understanding the context for what's, what's going on here. So self-awareness. Uh, and that's not just telling them about it, but training and practicing, um, which requires yeah. me to do my own training and my own practice. I think then it's also speaking with other board members. Um, and the number one practice is that I that I have is after every board meeting is trying speaking to as many board members as possible to asking for feedback for how I showed up. How did you experience me in that meeting? Uh, most post-board meeting calls between other board members, investors, tends to be about problems and issues. Where for my, f uh, oh, and often that normally is the focal point is the company or the CEO. I try and have more of them. The focal point being about how did I show up? How was I conducive? to healthy conversations. Mm -hmm. And if other board members want to ask for feedback, I'll give it to them. But mm -hmm. for me, the, the most important thing is it's showing a willingness and a, not even a willingness, a desire for continual feedback mm -hmm. about how you're showing up. Yeah. So <clears throat> now moving to Thunder Fuel, and I really would like to go into uh, our discussion around Notman House uh, mm -hmm. just after, but so, <clears throat> Again, Funder Fuel is your accelerator program. What makes a good Funder Fuel candidate? So that's sort of, I guess, probably shifted over time yeah. in terms of how we think. I would say uh, the number one thing that we're looking for now is openness. Um, are they... Um, are they open to having a conversation? Um, do they have, and, and by that what I mean is, do they already have a view of, of you or of the founder fuel team? Do they already have a view of you and what you are and how you're going to work and what it is? Um, or, and that they're looking at you as something that they know how to extract something from? Or are they looking at you as a gateway to ideas and experiences and networks that that they don't currently have? And I think if if they see you as a gateway, um, they're much more willing to to listen and engage. Mm -hmm. So I think this is, I would say, one one big thing that 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 
you they see you as a gateway rather than as a specific thing that they're going to get from you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I would say also, though, it's about insightful. There is some insight that they have um, through a lack of knowledge of a particular industry or through a deep knowledge. You can Insights can come from 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 either way because you're so there and you see things no one else sees or because you so, you step so far out yeah. you can see things that perhaps others don't see yeah. and that that insight is very different and really is setting the direction for where they're heading and how they're going to head there because the actual product and the actual thing you end up that's that's not you never really know what that is yeah. but the insight that's driving you is key. Yeah. So what were some of the key evolutions between the way that you were mentoring um, the, the teams at the beginning versus now, uh, 10 years after? What were some of the initial beliefs that uh, was proven to be wrong? Hmm. Uh, beliefs that were proven to be wrong. I would still say at the beginning, while I said we were looking at the people, we were probably still looking at the product and the idea. Mm. And at that stage, I think we've we come to see that, I mean, you mentioned Unsplash. No, Unsplash pivoted its business three times during Founder Fuel, yeah. and Unsplash itself, you know, it used to be called Crew. Crew. Before that, it was called Ulala. But did, did they join? Sorry, as... not, sorry, not Ulala. Umph. Ulala was another company. <laughs> did they join as being um, Umph? Uh, they joined crew, as being Umph, and they left as being Unsplash. No, no. They. they I left... think they. They left. Either they left as Umph or they left as crew yeah. but i think they left still left as umph and yeah. then they changed to crew and unsplash so unsplash crew was a, a design firm um more. yeah it was sort of yeah it was a yeah. design a design firm and and they or um yeah it was, it was a platform for design yeah. firms and and one of them one of their marketing products was unsplash to try and yeah. drive traffic and uh but it just it just took off. Yeah. It took off. So, yeah. So the what, 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 what the conversation during board meetings were at this time, where a decision had to be made between focusing and believing into the crew product versus pivoting and invest uh, fully within Unsplash. That was a very, very difficult set of conversations. Yeah. And the the challenge within the challenge within that conversation, but it's true in most in many conversations, is and it's a bit of a challenge with sometimes with the venture model, is the the different alignment that investors had and founders had based on when they invested and and where they were focused on. And so, um, and you know what it was that the individual investor believed in, and what it was that the individual investor had invested in, and what they told their partners they'd invested in, and what it was the founders sort of really believed in. So, I would say it was it was a very challenging series of questions, and I would say that that was a point where. I look upon that and I was, I think I was okay, but I, but only just okay. I, I definitely would have handled the conversations differently. I would definitely have guided the founders differently. I would have definitely have guided other board members differently. But I would say, despite all of that, we managed to work through it. Um, you know, the, and uh, yeah, we've de definitely managed to work through it. And 
in the end, we decided that we would we would operate two businesses separately. And then at one point, it became clear: okay, we're gonna we're gonna sell off the crew business, mm. and um, and and really focus on Unsplash. And yeah. I really I really enjoyed the the point when we were sort of going back to ideation. Spent a lot of time sitting around with Mikhail, the CEO, and like trying to tell the story for Unsplash and why it was that it was so. So I really it was almost like we had a a second opportunity mm. to to rebuild it and i really enjoyed that and obviously they went on and did an amazing job so i think that it's interesting the the, the point that you that you're mentioning that you love to go back a bit to the drawing board right i think that at the end you you were you are an entrepreneur yourself right and and um not not um creating your own company was something that i believe should have been, uh, I mean, there's this tension of supporting the others versus starting something yourself and being part of, of the adventure and, and getting your hands dirty in a way, right? Yeah. <clears throat> How do you balance those those two conflicting uh, desire or how on a day-to-day -day basis are trying to try to be always into this observer mode again, listening mm. modes and not being the one on the drawing boards, with the teams, iterating, designing. Do, do, do you see what I mean? I would say, though, I I mean, I, I do get enough of that still yeah. at the very earliest stages. Um, so I do get enough of that with the companies. But I would say I am fortunate, I think, that I get to do that with Real Ventures itself. That's true. Uh, you know, and I would say even Real Ventures right now is in some ways, I wouldn't say going back to the drawing board where we have, we're too big to go back to the drawing board, but we we are definitely sort of thinking, okay, hold on, how has, how has the world shifted and what opportunities are we seeing now? What needs are we seeing now that we didn't see before? So I would say, I still do get it from time to time with companies, um, and I love that, but I do get it to do it with my team. So, which brings us to Notman House, mm. right? So, Notman was one of your initial initiatives, right? So, it's this, not so much a product, but a service or a place, right? So, <clears throat> you, you, what was your vision at the beginning when you convince your partner to go into this crazy adventure of creating the Osmo, um, the Osmo Group and, and yeah. invest into this. I think it's a two century old uh, building, right? Yeah. That has been uh, abandoned for 10 years at, at the time. So w what did you see into this location that you believe will be part of your legacy? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure it'll be part of my legacy, but I'll uh, I'll answer the first bit of the question. So I think this comes back to the idea we talked about before you talked about community. And what was what was clear to me was when we had events and activities 2008, 2009, early 2010 the community was growing 300, 400, 500 people turning up at events. They were hungry for it. And the energy and the vibrancy and the exchanges that were going on were amazing. But they were only happening every three, four, five, six months. And that energy, and, and I would say the universities weren't engaged. There was no university stuff. There was, there was really just the startup ecosystem, but that was yeah. just events. And there was the idea was, how could you capture that energy and just keep it running a little bit longer um, so that you, it, it didn't dissipate so quickly? And so I have always been a big believer in, in community in terms of my own life, having to, wanting to go to a new place and trying to be find a community that I can relate to. And I've also 
also had a big fascination with the physicality of spaces, uh, whether that be, you know, the the Soho House type of private members environment or boutique hotels. And so I always had a fascination and a belief of uh, how motivating physicality could be. So it was a combination of of the the physicality plus community. And that property, uh, Notman House, I had I had actually visited it when I first came. I think early in two thousand and seven, because I was interested in like I wonder why has this been empty. This would be an amazing place for a private members club, and so I did go and have a look at it. And it was only in two thousand and ten, two thousand eleven. I'm like, you know what? We need that physicality. We need that community. I've been thinking about it as a private members club. How about it could be a club for startups? And the the physicality of it was so impressive, what I wanted to sort of say, and the location, because there were other places we were being offered like this floor on this building uh, or you know um, some stuff out in Ville Saint Laurent. And I was like, well, no, community has to be where they are. And from my experience, most people were hanging out on the plateau. Mm. This was very much on the plateau. I was actually living on the plateau. And it was that crossroads between the downtown and the plot plateau, um, uh, the physicality of the building, the, um, the, 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 the thing that I, one of these sentences I've had of, it just makes sense. I wanted something which, when people first looked at it, they'd be like, really? This building is going to be something about the future and not about the past? And then, oh, okay, it makes sense that, that we, should be, we should be appreciative of our past to build the future. And so it all sort of came together. I mean, that's a, that's a very short way of saying that we, we got Notman House up and running, but that was really what it was about. It, it was a little bit your Kenilworth castle in a way. Yes, I guess that is where I grew up. Um, yeah, though, I guess there was a, a little bit of that. I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it was built by a Scotsman and it's definitely part of the Anglo yeah. community. Uh, I didn't really realize that at the time, but it certainly was. But I think the... Being this, this protection, you know, right? This, this place, the central place where in a way you can protect them from from the rest of the world in a, in a sense and and create this inside life and community with yeah. with their a sense of independence i mean it's 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 not just an house where you you rent offices right it's it's a, it's a it's a place where you live in a sense that where mm. Yes, there's offices to work, but there's a cafe to, to chat and interact. There's uh, spaces for uh, yeah. uh, networking and presentation. I mean, I've, I've been to that man house so many times for so different re uh, different reasons. Mm. And it's it's a living place. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure that many people slept. Uh, oh, sure. <laughs> I'm sure. At some point. But it's, it's, it's again, I, it's, it's like a little castle uh, where you feel like you are in a bubble and you feel like you're part of a community, you are part of a mission Absolutely. and you you feel almost invincible there. You, you feel like you're part of, of a family. I'm happy that you feel that way about it. Um, and it is, it is about community. You know, you, the foundation, that owns it is called the Osmo Foundation. And, you know, it's really three sort of parts, the house at the front, the former hospital at the back, and the, the now the publicly open space, the cafe in the middle. And that, that the cafe is named after the foundation. It's called the Osmo, Cafe Osmo. And it's there. And I think the, the thing which struck me, the reason it's called Osmo is because it's short for osmosis. And the one thing which I, I, I sort of really did understand, and it has shown to be the case, is that community requires a boundary. 
you called it the castle, but let's say it, it requires some sort of boundary to sort of say, oh, I'm part of it. But uh, And without a boundary, and I don't necessarily just mean physical boundary, but without a boundary, how do you know you're part of a community? It's that boundary that makes you feel you're part of the community, whether it's the boundary is your family, whether it's it's your company, whatever it is. But the thing that I had experienced, and you also referenced it as an immigrant, and I'd experienced it many times, is it's great to be part of a community, but it's if that boundary is too tight, no one can get in. Mm. And for me, it was more important that people could get in. Yes. And so... Os, the, the osmotic barrier, the idea that there is a barrier, but that things can pass through yeah. and that the cafe is the entryway into that was very, very important yeah. for me. Um, and so this is why, it's, that's why it's called the Osmo Foundation. It's a, a place where there is community, but that entry into the community is is facilitated and made easy. Um because without new life feeling that they can come in, I think that that community can yeah. implode on itself. Yeah. So in order to, to, to found this, this project, right? So you, you, you raise around 7 million? Uh, to, uh, in to uh, maybe Osmo. actually, I think even more. Even in more. terms of equity and debt, I think it was a, almost closer to nine. Yeah. So you, you have raised nine millions in for uh, in order for osmo to create this project yeah. and we, which has been a success from a community viewpoint right from a financial viewpoint things ended up being more complicated right and this is a part that i don't understand i don't understand how amongst the most successful vcs in montreal that have been through hundreds of companies seeing uh, up and downs um, who are so well connected end up being into a situation where where it's it becomes difficult to foresee the future for for the foundation mm. so could you help me understand it a bit not necessarily all the details but how do you reflect on all of that and what what are some of the learnings that you will take away if you had to redo it again? Mm. Um, well, I think there's a number of things. Firstly, the foundation upon which anything is built is really important. And I would say that uh that the the foundation that we were built upon you know people at the bdc and investors mont quebec really were really um believed and understood what it was that we were trying to do um and they they really got behind it and provided a level of funding that was needed for it to happen, but probably we structured it in a way which was in the long term always not, not sustainable. And I think the low interest rates um, sort of made that. You know, there was a lot of there was a lot of a lot of debt that was used as a way to do it. And I mean, and I think the reason that I think the BDC and IQ sort of recognized that that we're stretching the limits, but I don't think no, any any of us would have really appreciated what was coming with the likes of COVID and then with the interest rates rising as they did. And so I think foundationally, when I look at the balance sheet, it was perhaps not structured ideally. But on the other hand, um, it it sort of the it still needed to happen it's still it's still as in something like notman still needed to happen and the way i look upon it is 
that yes, there was probably too much money invested into it for the purposes that we put it to use. But it then did hit a couple of, you know, completely unexpected black swan type events, which I think had an impact on it. Um, so I'd say foundationally, there was probably some issues in how it was structured. Um, I would have liked to have structured it differently at the beginning, but most, most like government didn't really believe in it, mm. you know? And so part of it I'm looking at is, you know, how I would have loved to have structured it better if we could have got other people to believe in it. But the point is no one really did believe in it. So, you know, the biggest questions we were getting from the governments were at the time, well, like it's going to be a white elephant. Will you even fill it? That's certainly mm -hmm. certainly not the issue, and that's why you know so many other places that have done. So I'd say that was the that was the the first thing. I think secondly, um, the I think the link with real ventures, I'm told, had positives and negatives. I mean, positive in terms of like how much we powered it, but mm -hmm. you know negative like in as much as we we had intended that would be multiple venture capital firms when it first started but and we were working with um with one of the divisions of the case to depot originally to try and be our partner in it uh but they ended up pulling out and then in the end you know we had um espas cdbq which is now vc central mm -hmm. But actually, there was no SBAS CDBQ, and we wanted yeah. more venture firms to be based there. So I think we were we were doing a lot of things in which we expected more people to get behind it. Mm. But um, some people, I think, felt that it was too much real. Yeah. So I, again, I'm not sure if that's the case. So um, so maybe that was an issue. Um, Did you feel like sometime you you renounced to some? Um, earnings because you wanted to focus on this community aspect. As an example, I I organize a bunch of events in at, at Nodman, right? I, I use mm. the space for so many things. It was amazing. But I always it was always free <laughs> for yep. me to, to do so, right? So it was an amazing opportunity for me to organize and rally the community in a, in a place. But at another time, it was a missed opportunity for you to maybe make um, some some revenue. So, how did you balance the the the, the business model or the different earnings uh, source versus trying to be an, a non profit organization, trying to do the best, and trying to have, as you mentioned, a thin entry barrier and making sure that everyone could benefit from this social place? Mm. Well, I think our our view was that. We always wanted it to be as free as possible for community, for instigators. You know, uh, the whole the whole idea of Notman was that we were a canvas or uh, a sandbox on which others could come in and build their ideas. Mm. The, we always thought that if we were organizing stuff and we had the ideas, that that would perhaps reduce the level of activity and investment in the commun uh, community yeah. community initiatives. And I actually think if you look at this Montreal startup ecosystem, as more and more universities and governments have got involved, there are more and more people being paid to do things than there are people like yourself, perhaps, who just have a passion and want mm -hmm. to, to do it because yeah. they're aligned and they love it. And I think that 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 the wild garden, as Alan McIntosh would say, because he's Scottish, as opposed to the the cultivated garden, which I would yeah. say because I'm English. I mean, I definitely buy into the, the wild garden. That wild garden, just creating a space where things can pop up, I think that was always our idea. And so we needed to make it easy for that type yeah. of thing to happen. And I would say, you know, in the big picture, we've been going now for 12 years. It's the world that you know the whole ecosystem has suddenly shifted there are many 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 places which are particularly in universities and university initiative things uh and government funded things where there are groups now that are offering you know related services and related spaces and so i would say 
we were we have been able to keep going for 12 12 and a half years and it was really done through sponsorships and it was done through through rent but we had some amazing sponsors and i would say the the biggest issue is that we probably lost one of our major sponsors at, almost at the same time that covid hit mm. and our our strategic plan had been as the ecosystem comes back that's the perfect time for Notman House. And I think we actually are seeing that. Notman has never been more vibrant. The ecosystem has has, has really started to, to come in, but uh, really started to pick up and it's everything is, is buzzing and so full. But there really was a big issue in terms of during that two period of t- two years of COVID of like, like oh, is anyone really going to sponsor or yeah. invest in physical yeah. space? I think we're starting to see that those types of physical spaces are going to take off. But. So the, the past two to three years, three to four years, maybe have been difficult years, right? Uh, the pandemic, the, this back swan event, as you mentioned, right? Really uh, eat you, uh, eat you at the real and, and, uh, and, uh, and the foundation. Uh, you, you had uh, some of your uh, co-founders of, of real moved to uh, other projects. Um, you, uh, you you had uh, you had to put on hold your uh, last um, found number five. Osmo as ten- but maybe my question to you is how do you feel today? <laughs> uh, I would say um, that the the emotions range. There are times, I guess, when I feel. I would say the lowest I get is I would call it melancholy. Mm. Um, but um, most of the time I feel blessed and um, and um, blessed in terms of the experiences that I've had, the contributions that I and the team have made have been, are still fully appreciated and recognized. And I also think that there is an opportunity, a very timely opportunity to go back to the drawing board. And I don't mean go back, uh, go back to the drawing board full of excitement and hope and belief and a little bit of compulsion to do something that I think the, the the startup ecosystem needs, which is different from from what exists. So I am I'm not I'm not a, obviously I'm not uh, oblivious to all of those things, but I am I am excited about the opportunity to to reinvent that would not have been possible had I and the team been on the the same treadmill. You know, I was talking about board meetings and the content and the context. And I think that we would probably still be trapped in the content of like, doing what you always do and focused on the minutia and not having had that opportunity to step back and observe. And I think Real Ventures and, and Osmo and myself, my team, we have been we have been given a gift that we still have a very sizable firm, a lot of portfolio companies, a lot of work to do. But we've we've sort of been given space to observe and reflect and come back with a new story not a new story for real because our stories are never about us well sometimes we i guess we might get sucked into them being about us but a new story for the ecosystem um yeah a new and i think that we're i am and I know the team, my teams are very excited about a new story for the ecosystem where I think our ecosystem can serve as a 
as a an, a sandbox not only for for Montreal but perhaps for other places in the world as well. Yeah. We're going to 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 finish in a couple of seconds, but before I have a last question for you, what would you say to the ten years old John who's going to leave uh, the UK to go to New Zealand for the first time? What would you tell him to? Hmm. I guess don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Um, you know, you're you're going to be given um, amazing experiences. You're going to see amazing things. Don't be afraid. Just, uh, just appreciate, appreciate the experiences you're going to have. Thanks a lot. There was a lot of other topics I wanted to, um, to, to discuss with you. Unfortunately, we didn't have time today. But I'm going to put the links in the description. I really would like to invite everyone listening. Uh, and if you're listening to this point, it's probably that you loved the discussion. Uh, so go read some of uh, John's articles, um, especially uh, some of your, your writings after what happened for the Silicon Valley banks. Uh, I feel it was very interesting. You are talking about what it means to be a uh, um, human optimist versus a techno optimist or yep. techno pessimist. I really loved um, what you wrote there. You are talking a lot about the need to change our outer system uh, and but also our inner system uh, through a lot of um, a lot of of, um, of personal development and how to uh, to approach that. Uh, so it's maybe a discussion for another hour or two there. Yeah. Um, so hopefully there will be a part two where we'll be able to to go through that. Um, you are talking about the 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 shift that happened between this stakeholder uh, uh, um, uh, stakeholder supremacy to oh, sh uh, shareholder uh, sh shareholder uh, um, uh, supremacy to shareholder supremacy with that need to be uh, added to uh, the ecosystem uh, um, primacy as well. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know what were your thoughts around environmental pre pre um, um, primacy at, at, uh, in, in the future and how mm. uh, we are going to evolve uh, through that. Um, you, you, have, you have participated to many uh, initiatives around the, uh, the Canadian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. You work with the Chamber of Commerce as well. I wanted to understand how you felt that your impact could have been into those, uh, those uh, organizations towards some of those changes. Um, but I will, uh, will, uh, I will invite everyone to, to listen first and uh, I will put a link to all those articles in the, in the description. And um, yeah, hopefully a, a part two where we'll be able to go in more details for all of those. Certainly, Marius, I appreciate the, appreciate the, t the taking the time and the questions and uh, a lot of the things that you're referring there are part of that, um, uh, the results of some of the observing that we've done and um, I think some of the the things that we're we're going to be bringing to the ecosystem soon are very much related to the the thoughts that underpin much yeah. of that. So thanks yeah. for drawing attention to it. Oh, it was it was a pleasure. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you. Cheers. If you are still here, it means that you love this discussion. Please subscribe, share on you, and see you next time.